My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Wednesday, February 1st, 2017. I'm here with George Johnson at his home in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. George, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes. So as you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your involvement in Fabrengen, and the impact that the Chabara has had on your own um, life and beyond to the larger Jewish world. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background and to flesh out a bit um, who you were at the time you first got involved with Fabrengen. So can we start um, by um, you're telling me briefly about your family when you were growing up, your, your, your parents um, and other family members. Starting from where in their lives, for example. Who they were when you were growing up. My, and or where your parents, you know, your family came from. My, my mother was Canadian when she married my father mm -hmm. uh, in 1935. My father uh, was born and raised on Long Island in New York. And my father was uh, a gas station proprietor in Port Washington, Long Island. Uh, he subsequently, after the war, uh, became a car dealer. He sold foreign cars. He was a businessman. And my mother uh, did not work for the most part, although she, I think she did jobs like she was a salesperson in one of the department stores or was, uh, did office work. But most of the time I remember her being home. Uh, and. I think on my father's side, I think originally when they came to the U.S., he came in, he was born in 1909 and his father came in 1902. And his, his uh, wife's parents, I think, were founders of a Long Island uh, synagogue, but it was Orthodox. But they did not uh, live uh, Orthodox lives, as far as I could tell. My f mother's family, I never met my grandfather, except when I was, he died when I was two. Uh, and uh, they lived, she was, had been born in Cochrane, Ontario, which is in the far north of Ontario, and lived in London, Ontario, and Toronto, Ontario. And they were, I guess, conservative Jews. My father was the first president, I think, of Temple Beth Israel in Port Washington, Long Island. And I think it was founded sometime in the 30s or late 30s. And uh, we kept a kosher home. You have siblings? I have two sisters. I'm the middle child. I have a sister who's five years older and a sister who's five years younger. And uh, family background. Um, one of my uh, mother's br brothers uh, married my father's sister, so and they lived on Long Island also. Okay. So they lived in Sayville, in my uh, Long Island, which is in Suffolk County. And so when we had family get-togethers, which was virtually every Sunday, uh, at my grandparents' house, my father's parents' house. Uh, it was a large gathering every week, and uh, so they were there. So I had two cousins who, their girls are older than I am, uh, who, uh, who had the same four grandparents. It's <laughs> an unusual story. Yeah. Yeah. So you were born in 1942. Yes. In um, Port Washington. That's right. Um, this was a time before Port Washington had many Jews living there, I gather. Um, That's correct. That's correct. What when was I, it like for you growing up there as a child? Uh, well, you felt different. I felt different. Uh, I was very conscious of the fact that I was Jewish because I had no Jewish friends, no Jewish classmates until fourth grade. So, you know, in those days, you know, it, there were, that was before po political correctness. And before the, the 
the work of the ACLU or whoever it was, the ADL, that, that uh, got religion out of the public schools. There was plenty of religion in the public schools. And so that was, had an effect that, that uh, made me feel different. And uh, Beyond the Christmas celebrations, there was a lot of religion in the schools? Well, I can't remember exactly. Christmas obviously would have been the main time. What happened in fourth grade? Two, uh, two Jewish boys moved into the neighborhood, one of whom actually lives in Washington and not too far from here now. Um, and the other one, we were, all, we were friends together, and, mm -hmm. but that started with fourth grade. Huh. And, uh, but until then, uh, had uh, maybe there were some Jewish friends through, through uh, the synagogue, but not in school. And yet, it sounds like um, some of the main businesses in, in the area were owned by Jewish families. In fact, most of them, actually. Uh, it was this um, group of Jewish businessmen who formed the shul. I mean, the, the furniture store, the drug store, the hardware store, the, the men's haberdashery or the clothing store, the optometrist, uh, and then one of the friends, he, his father was a caterer. He had a restaurant near the high school. Uh, and I'm probably leaving out a few, but many of the main businesses were uh, owned by Jews. And uh, so I, I think that was pretty typical of small town USA in, in you know earlier times, but it was true of Port Washington in the 40s and yeah. beginning of the 50s. And yet their children weren't in school with you? Uh, not in my class. They, so when you were in sixth grade, you moved to a nearby town? Right. The, my, my parents uh, wanted to move to uh, Roslyn. And uh, the house that uh, they bought wasn't finished. So we lived one year in Roslyn Heights. And uh, then when the house was finished, we moved the next year to uh, Roslyn. What was Roslyn like and what was the draw of Roslyn for your parents? I think it was more Jewish. There were two big synagogues in Roslyn Heights, actually. Uh, and there were, I think, were going to be more Jews in the schools. Uh, I think that was the main consideration that I can think of, although there might have been others. And how did that affect you in terms of how you felt? Well, it was more comfortable. Uh, had more friends, had more peers in the synagogue environment. Right. How would you describe the Jewish environment in your home? You described your family as conservative Jews. What did, what did that mean in terms of your parents' attitudes towards observance and actual mm -hmm. practice in your home? We, um, well, we celebrated Shabbat in, in a way. Uh, we kept kosher, uh, and that, in terms of celebrating Shabbat, that meant lighting candles and having a Shabbat meal, uh, and then going to synagogue Friday night, driving to synagogue, and then m many times went to Saturday morning, and we had Seder, and uh, never, I don't think we celebrated Sukkot or Shavuos. Um, and you said you kept kosher, but, quote, not too strictly. Not too strictly. There what was a third mean? set of dishes, some glass dishes that uh, my mother would bring Chinese food home for. And we would go out to Chinese rest or Chinese restaurant, usually on Thursday night. That was the night. Not sure how that <laughs> custom started, but I think it was pretty widespread. Yeah. And your dad uh, worked a lot, it sounded like, on seven days a week or yeah, so. He, as the proprietor of this station, gas station, he was there virtually all the time. He had a, a half day on Sunday until sort of late in the day he closed on Sunday at some point. But when I was growing up, for the most part, he was working uh, Monday through Friday until maybe nine o'clock. He came home for dinner, and maybe he came home for lunch. I'm not sure. No. <clears throat> and 
he worked all day on, sat to, on Saturday until six, and then Sunday morning. And then we'd, he'd come home, we'd have dinner. Uh, very often we went out to eat on Sunday for Sunday lunch. And then from there we would drive out to uh, Northport, East Northport, Long Island, to visit uh, his parents. And that's where the whole mishpacha got together. So how was uh, Saturday? Um... Saturday was, typically it would have been, I would go to shul in the morning. They didn't call it shul at that time. Um, and uh, then uh, what I remember, I'm sure it wasn't every week, but uh, we lived very close to the, uh, my father's station. Uh, we live about five or six blocks up the street. Uh, and so, and then the movie theater, and then there was a little eatery between the movie theater and my father's station on the same block. So I would come down and I would have, uh, I would eat at this Beacon Sweet Shop was the name of it. And my favorite thing was uh, Jiffy Steak. And I would have it for lunch. And then from there, I would go to the movies. And my father, of course, was a businessman almost next door. So I would just charge it. It was always a big treat to just say, charge it. <laughs> and then I would go to the movies. I saw many iconic movies there. You know, the original Superman series, the cartoons, Contiki. Um, you know, I had many great experiences Saturday afternoon going to the movies. And then when I was a little older, I played Little League Baseball in the uh, Saturday morning, which would, I guess in the spring would take me away. I wasn't going to shul then, I guess. Yeah. Uh, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Um, your mother, you said, was involved in Zionist organizations? Yeah. She uh, was, very, was a very ardent Zionist, and uh, her, her father was a was also an ardent Zionist, uh, very well known in the Toronto community. I, she showed me, and I still have a, um, a clipping uh, from his funeral. 500 people came to his funeral. And uh, he was a businessman, but uh, also a writer. He, he wrote in the Yiddish press. And um, um, I lost my train of thought. What? You're talking about organizations. And, and oh, my mother. And my Zionism. mother. Yeah, my mother's uh, was president of a whole bunch of different Hadassah chapters. And uh, no matter where she was, whether it was in Port Washington or Roslyn or in West Palm Beach, she, when they moved to Florida, she was president of one of the chapters down there. And... Uh, They made trips to Israel, and they were very proud of um, having their name on the wall at, I guess it was Hadassah Hospital, I'm not sure. And uh, my mother was very proud of the pins that she got, and she gave at least one of them to my wife. Um, Do you have any personal memories of the founding of the state of Israel? No. Little, not little really. Boy. Not really. Uh, I'm sure I was made aware of it. and. And uh, I mean, my first memories of politics was uh, the end of the Second World War, and that was three years before. So I, I, I think that um, you know, it was two years. My first recollection is two years after the end of the war, and so it was a, a year before uh, founding of the state. So I'm sure I became aware of it, but I don't have any specific recollections. Yeah. You mentioned Yiddish, that your, your grandfather was a, wrote a Yiddish writer. Yeah. Was Yiddish familiar to you from your home environment or from your there was, parents? Yes, in a way. My parents spoke Yiddish to each other, uh, mainly when they didn't want the children to understand what they were saying. And for the most part, we didn't. Sometimes we did. And uh, so Yiddish was spoken. My, my mother knew uh, Yiddish songs and used to play the piano and company herself singing these songs also english but uh, yeah they both knew yiddish spoke yiddish but they didn't particularly want us to learn it or try to teach it to us so if we picked anything up it was just accidentally yeah. and your grandfather spoke to you in, in english yes 
I, well, I, I don't know about one, but the, the other, yes, my father's father. So what kind of Jewish education did you have growing up? And what was your experience of it? Well, in Port Washington, there were very, very few Jewish boys, uh, and even fewer my age. And I, my recollection, and the shul was a very kind of simple uh, place. Uh, it wasn't wider than our house here. It was narrower, probably. Along, it was like a bowling alley shaped. And uh, they did have a religious school, uh, so to speak, in the basement. But I have recollections of learning with a rabbi Harbader, I guess. But they used to go to his house and uh, pre-bar mitzvah, but not pre-bar mitzvah, it was earlier when I was, I say, eight years old. Um, so I went to, had Hebrew instruction when I was a little boy, and then there were classes, I pretty, I'm pretty sure, because I remember learning about uh, the Abraham story and stuff like that in, in that building uh, in Port Washington. But, uh, you know, I moved to Roslyn in, for sixth grade. So from there, from there I was enrolled in classes at the synagogue, in, the conservative synagogue in, in Roslyn Heights, which is Temple Beth Shalom. And that's where I was bar mitzvahed and uh, confirmed. That confirmation even in this conservative show. Yeah, uh, that was pretty uh, standard in reform and conservative synagogues at that time. What kind of a learning environment did you find the uh, Hebrew school and, and Sunday school in this new community? Terrible. Terrible? It was terrible in almost every way. <laughs> Can you describe that <laughs> a little? Well, what I remember, the two, there were two things, the, the two big strikes against it was the, the kids, in general, had no interest in afternoon school. Was this girls as well as boys? I don't remember any girls, to tell you the truth. Uh, there might have been some girls there, but I don't remember any. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, most of it was, you know, and then there was the teacher. And you, sometimes, or maybe it was often, it was an imported uh, yeshiva student or somebody like that from Brooklyn whose English was okay, but not that great, and really didn't know how to, didn't know much about how to teach kids in a suburban, non-religious environment, uh, and very little ability to control them. And so the environment was, you didn't learn very much. And if you wanted to learn, there was a real problem. And I was one of those people who wanted to learn. And, uh, we didn't, never got too far. I mean, we learned to read the prayer book. Uh, and, certain, and I think by the time I got to con confirmation classes, um, you know, we learned about Jewish history. It was instruction from the rabbi. And I remember those classes. We learned, we learned the, about the judges. And bar mitzvah, you know, I did bar mitzvah instruction there, I guess, with the cantor. Um, and I remember my, my bar mitzvah. In those days, um, there were a lot of kids in my cohort, and this was 1955, 1955 I was bar mitzvah, and so it was pretty common. I shared the bar mitzvah date with uh, another child. I still remember his name, and uh, we, we, the congregation had to suffer two versions of, of Kitavo. <laughs> But the uh, Haftorah, we, in those days, we did not read the, the, uh, the Torah. That was not something that was taught. And uh, the rabbi didn't have a very high opinion of our learning. I remember in confirmation class, uh, he taught us uh, the last part of the Shema to sing, the last few lines. And I remember him int introducing it as uh, this very esoteric melody. And uh, 
And it wasn't only later that I realized it was just the regular Torah reading. <laughs> but, you know, it showed, showed a certain amount of disrespect, it seemed to me. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it was not a positive learning experience. Was there a youth group yes. at the synagogue? Were you involved in it? I actually joined the Reform Youth Group because my friends were in the Reform, most of my friends, and that was the in place to be. It was the Reform one down the road. There was a Temple Sinai. I'm trying to remember what the name was. It was on the other side of the Northern, Northern State Park, a little bit to the south. And so I joined, I think it was Nifty, whatever it was. Uh, and... Uh, that was the better youth group, my youth group. I, I probably was part of that youth group at the, the Temple Beth Shalom also, but I did. So you also attended Jewish summer camp? Yeah, starting when I was about six. So that sounds like it had a, uh, an impact on you. Can you tell us about your experience there? Well, I don't really remember much about the first year. It was a camp in Pennsylvania, I believe. But when I was six going on seven, I think it was, started going to Sedgwin camps, which I think was loosely affiliated or very affiliated with the conservative movement. And uh, it was really a great experience. It, it, was, it was a very Jewish uh, experience. It was a very Jewish communal experience. There was a lot of learning that was done. But the main thing about it that was different from the rest of my life was that it was a very positive environment for being Jewish. We really didn't have that positive environment when I was uh, on Long Island. It was, you know, it, it was on the one hand, people weren't interested in learning that I was in contact with, and um, the instruction wasn't that great. Uh, and I was among non-Jews, so it wasn't it wasn't great to be Jewish in those days because I got picked on. Uh, I had no, I had non-Jewish friends mainly. And uh, I stood out a little. So. so here was an environment that was a more immersive and very Jewish environment. And of course, and also let me say that Roslyn was different. But you know that w I was in Port Washington until fifth grade, through fifth grade. So, so your Sedgwin years actually coincided with uh, Port Washington. Yeah, and that was the reason my mother sent me to those camps because she thought that I needed to be around Jewish children had to have a more positive environment, Jewish so, environment. Do you have memories of any particular things that happened during camp that had an Im impact on you? Well, there were two things that I can remember. Um, when I was going on nine, the summer I was going on nine, uh, it was the second year at Sejuan, and they were um, asking for people to volunteer to be in, this, in the camp play. I had been in the, I had a very small role in the previous year's play, and so the counselors who did the play contacted me, and um, they were doing um, Joseph and his brothers, and they basically wrote a musical, and there were two camp counselors that were involved, and two boys, and I was one of them. And so we wrote the music and the lyrics to the songs during rest period, which was really, that was special. Got out of rest period for, the, for most of the summer. And then when it came time for the play, which was the first week in August, there was a, an after, afternoon version that was for the camp, uh, for the small children camps, camps that were, you know, there were seven or eight camps and for different age groups, for the, low, the lower ones came to the afternoon show. And I was the lead, uh, I was Joseph. And when it came to, and to show you, it, it was, you know, it was really a wonderful experience, really wonderful experience. I could still hum you a melody from one of the songs. Can you, can you do it? Oh, woe is me, I cannot tell. Oh, what, something, what befell. That was, I don't know when I was in prison or what that was, but, uh, well, I was really into it. And I guess I had a pretty good voice. And when it came time to meet Jacob, 
when he came to Egypt and I was supposed to cry, I actually broke down. Well, this really impressed the counselors. So, so they contacted my parents and they asked them to drive up to the camp for the evening performance. And I didn't know that. And so I saw them afterward. I was very proud and felt very good about that. And I was kind of like a star from that time forward. And they wanted me to do something in the next year, but I, my voice changed. And it was, in the pro it was in the process of changing. So I couldn't sing. <laughs> so I was finished. <laughs> that, was my, that was the end of my acting career. <laughs> it sounds like it must have been um, a sort of a singular experience in terms of such an intensive relationship working with these counselors on a text, on a story, a biblical story, and bringing it to life in a way that must have been extremely engaging for you. Absolutely. Then the, the, the next year or the last year I was in camp, I forget which year it was, maybe it was, no, it was the next year, I had a yeshiva student as a counselor, and uh, Don, his name was, and he had a big influence on me. Uh, and I remember telling my mother uh, at, uh, I think it was during Parents Weekend, you know, how close I was getting to him and how interested in what I was. And uh, I think it was maybe the next year I fasted on Tisha B'Av. Uh, and I remember my mother uh, telling me that she did not want me to become a rabbi. And um, I think she felt like um, it, was, <laughs> it was not a good profession for a good Jewish, nice Jewish boy. Uh, her brother was, was it her brother yeah, who was the rabbi? Yeah, And a well-known one at that. Yeah. And so I got kind of like this signal did not, not do that. But I think if she had encouraged me, I, I might have gone in that direction. You know, the, those are the two major things I remember. But what kind of influence did this Yeshiva Bachar he, counselor have on you? Oh, a positive model. He was a role model. He was a role model. In what sense? Well, he was somebody who was religious and learned. And so being religious and being learned was a positive value, and more so than the general uh, counselor there. There weren't many of these kinds of people at this camp. So you were just saying that you considered being a rabbi, or it might have... It entered my mind. It entered your mind. And you had an uncle, as I just mentioned, who was a, a well-known rabbi. Um, did he have any influence? Tell us a little bit about him and what kind of influence he had, if any, on your own sense of Jewishness and what was possible. I don't remember him specifically having uh, a big influence on, a direct influence on me. But what, what was his position? What did he he, do? he was um, he was a director of interfaith relations for the American Jewish Committee, and that was a very big job in those days. For example, he was the person who led a, uh, a group of uh, rabbis to the Soviet Union in 1955, and uh, that was the first visit of rabbis to the Soviet Union from America. And it was a very big story. He, he wrote two articles that appeared on the front page of the New York Times uh, with his picture. and. Uh, he was on television quite a bit. Uh, he became known as the television rabbi. He did seders uh, on TV. His, uh, my cousin, his daughter, the oldest of his children, was bat mitzvah on television. Um, he was um, a very a good role model. But in terms, and also things that he was doing filtered to, to us, like for example, he was uh, a follower of Mordecai Kaplan. Uh, he was ordained in 1934, and so in the 50s, I think a, I'm sitting forward, okay. Uh, he brought to us, or gave to us, the first Reconstructionist Seder, a Haggadah. And I remember using it at our Seder. So he was, 
he, he was the kind of person who uh, had made an impression on me, but specifically, you know, did I say, oh, I want to be like my Uncle Morris? First of all, he was way out of my league as far as I was concerned. He was, he was up there and I was down here. So there was no question of me trying to be like him. Uh, but having him around and seeing him regularly, which we did, uh, could, must have had some kind of a positive influence. Do you think he recognized you in, in your interest in Judaism and tried to nurture it in any way? I think he, he tried to do that for all his uh, young relatives. He was really uh, very involved in everyone in the family. Uh, he was he went to every event. In fact, he went to our I and my wedding in Israel. Uh, he happened to be in Israel so anyway, but he was under the chuppah, which was a little bit unusual for a, a situation like that, being then a reform rabbi. Um, he, he migrated from conservative to reconstructionist to reform over the course of his rabbinate. <laughs> But he was ordained as a conservative. Yes, rabbi? yes. So that you know, he he had an influence, but I can't say what specifically he changed in my life. So, despite these influences, you sort of turned away, moved away from Judaism somewhat during your high school years. That's exactly right. And why was that? Well, I became very critical of the synagogue environment. I felt. It's like it was a really empty spiritual experience. And uh, I, I felt like I needed something more. I wanted something more in terms of uh, spiritual um, growth uh, and experience uh, than it was affording me. I mean, I was learning there, but I didn't... The environment seemed kind of... Wrote. Most, you know, most of the people in this environment were not knowledgeable. They knew the prayers, but they didn't necessarily know the, what they were reading. Um, and as I said, with the children, it was kind of a negative uh, feeling. Even though we went to Hebrew school and all that, it was kind of negative. Um, You got interested in Elvis Huxley oh, yeah, right. during this period? I started, I don't know how I got onto reading Elvis Huxley. I think I probably read uh, Brave New World first, but then I found out uh, that he had written all these uh, mystical kind of books and started reading them, and I became fascinated. And I, I really wasn't acquainted with mysticism at all. Uh, and I certainly didn't know anything about Jewish mysticism, which I didn't learn about that until much, much later. Uh, but that really, the, I, the ideas and the, the feelings that I got from reading his books was a kind of a, it turned me on to this thing. And so I read almost every one of his books of that genre. And uh, through the last few years, two, two years of high school, and uh, into my freshman year in college. So uh, that's where I turned to for my religious experience, my spiritual experience. Yeah. Your college years um, at Cornell, 1964 to 60 no. to 64. Yes, right. 60 to 64, coincided with the period of really growing social ferment that spawned the growth of the counterculture as well as the civil rights movement and growing up op opposition to the war in Vietnam, to what extent were you, if at all, involved with and influenced by these larger social movements of the times? Well, it was hard not to have some contact with the civil rights movements. Uh, even in high school, uh, there were, there's, many of my friends were, um, were involved in the civil rights movement. And You're talking about in the late 50s now. In the late 50s. And uh, we, I graduated high school in 1960. And uh, that got me involved in, in some ways with the civil rights movement. But I felt, I don't know, I was kind of like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not contrapuntal, but uh, uh, 
I, I always wanted to be different in some way, somehow. So instead of really getting that directly involved in going south or going to sit-ins and this, I, did, I decided to do a, a, a research a study about restricted covenants on Long Island. And so I wrote a paper, I think, on that. For, uh, for one of your college classes? No, I was in high school. Oh, this was in high school still. You're talking about the 50s. Yeah. So my so I, I was conscious of and, and peripherally involved in that kind of uh, stuff in the late 50s. And then in college, I really was not. Um, I, I was on the school newspaper and the editor-in-chief and the editorial page editor, uh, they were really left-wingers. And I consider myself a conservative next to them. And I, I mean, I was sympathetic with the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King came to Cornell. I remember it was a big deal. But I, I was more in the middle. I was not uh, a civil rights activist uh, in, the, in the early 60s. It, and Is that Cornell, because you weren't an activist activist or because you weren't um, really caught up in what the civil rights movement was about? I think I, I was sympathetic to it, but um, I can't think of, I, I, I just, I, my main involvement besides my fraternity, I joined a fraternity, um, a Jewish fraternity. My main extracurricular involvement was with the Cornell Daily Sun, which I joined the second semester. So this is the newspaper? The newspaper. And it was there that, you know, I seem to be to the center or maybe even to the right of the leadership. And um, so that's where I felt I, I was. Uh, it wasn't that I didn't sympathize with uh, civil rights or anything like that, but uh, I wasn't really active in it. So you then went on to uh, Columbia Law School in 1964, graduated in 67, correct? Yeah. Um, how did you decide on the law? And what were you seeing as possible career directions for yourself? Well, it was really a default. I, I really was interested in political science, government, and history, um, and journalism. But I, I really thought about uh, going into, for a PhD in history or government. But uh, I guess I was so in awe of my professors. I didn't feel like. I could reach that level. And in journalism, I really loved journalism, really loved it. I loved everything I did at the Cornell Sun. And um, Did you have a beat? What did yeah, you to write I about? did have two beats. I had my, my first beat was the Interfraternity Council. And then after that, it was the student government. So I had, when I, by the end of my sophomore year, I had the best beat uh, in the news staff, which was student government. But then I tried to join the editorial board. And so I left. Oh, as part of the news board, I competed for managing editor. They had a comp competition. They call it competing, uh, compete or something. Um, anyway, each spring, people competed uh, for the editorships. So both. My sophomore and junior year, I competed to be managing editor and wasn't chosen for either managing editor or assistant managing editor. There were a lot of very good people who were on the news board at that time, and I just uh, didn't make it. So when that happened, I tried to join the editorial board, but I didn't make the editorial board. I wasn't politically uh, in tune with them. And so... Uh, Where were they? Where, where, how were you not politically in tune? They were really far left. They were far left. And I wasn't there. And uh, I changed over time. And I think 6064 was not, if, if it was a time of ferment, it was really uh, the beginning of black power. And uh, I didn't identify with that. Um, 
was the beginning of feminism, but really it wasn't a force then. I mean, Betty Friedan wrote her book, I think, in 1963. 63. Feminine Mystic. Feminine Mystic, yeah. And uh, it was not, a, it, it was there. People were interested in that. But this kind of ferment really, you know, Cornell from 1960 to 1964 was not a place of social ferment, social yeah, there action. Were, there were students going south from Cornell at that point. Oh, yeah. The yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Voter registration drives, I yeah. believe. Yeah. So you went to law school. Well, yeah, your last question was, why did I go to law school? Mm -hmm. And it was mainly, I thought about doing the first two things I mentioned, um, becoming a professor or being a journalist. And I kind of thought there were drawbacks to both. And so I decided to go to law school uh, because I was interested in government. And I thought, well, this is a good way to move in that direction or any direction that I decided I really didn't know what I wanted to do, so I applied to law school and got in and went. Um, what did you see yourself doing at that point, or was it still totally sort of amorphous? I mean, as a lawyer. I really did not focus on it. Um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but. I think my impulse was to go into government. Mm -hmm. I, I took, well, first summer I worked for the American Arbitration Association. The second summer I had two offers. Uh, one was to work in the USAID, in the State Department, and the other one was to work for Arlen Specter. Uh, he was the DA in Philadelphia at the time. And unfortunately, Fortunately, the general counsel of USAID called me first. The same day, our inspector called me, but I'd already accepted the job <laughs> at the State Department. So uh, I think it was clear that I was interested in public service. I was never interested in private practice, never. I ultimately did go into private practice, but I was not interested in business. Uh, my father was a businessman, and I kind of distanced myself from that. I didn't want to be a businessman. I didn't, I wasn't, I went for interviews with, you know, Wall Street firms, because I, I had good grades. But it all seemed really odd to me. I could never picture, I couldn't picture myself writing uh, these books of agreements, you know, these indentures, you know. I would go to these Wall Street firms and they would have, the guy would interview me and he had behind him, and he would talk about them. Oh, this, this set of books was an indenture for this financing. And this, I, I just really felt out of place. I, I knew I didn't want to do that. And I, so I thought of, you know, I'd probably go into government. And I did apply for a government job after law school in the attorney general in the Justice Department Antitrust Division. I think I got an offer, but I'm not sure. But I, I deferred it because I was going into the Army. So 1967, when, when you graduated from Columbia, this was a period where anxiety about the draft and serving was growing. There was growing anti-war activism and sentiment, particularly among young people. What was your personal situation? How did you feel about the draft and the war? Yeah. Well, I, it put, I, I was already an officer. I was a second lieutenant when I went to law school because I was commissioned as an officer in, in college. You'd been in ROTC. ROTC. So I was already in the Army, so to speak. And why had you decided to do that? Well, I didn't want to be drafted, and I was pretty patriotic. Um, you know, I just thought it was uh, better to be an officer than an enlisted man, and it was good to be in the army and to serve the country. Um, it was voluntary for the first time at Cornell for my freshman year. It had been mandatory. To do ROTC? Yeah, yeah up, up through the entry class in 1959, yeah. 
So I, um, I tried actually to back out of uh, ROTC after two years. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it, but I had one of these heart-to-heart -heart talks with one of the instructors or mentors in the ROTC program, and he, uh, he persuaded me that uh, if I dropped out, I would be, uh, you know, uh, an enlisted man and I would not fare as well as uh, if I were an officer. So I just stayed in and got, got my commission at what, same year week as graduation. But when I went to law school, I, was, I deferred my active duty. And in those days, uh, this was the fall of 1964, Vietnam was really not on, the, on my radar at all. I, if there was anything in Southeast Asia, there was involvement in Laos. So it didn't seem like a, a problem, you know. But once the Vietnam War started to turn from just some advisors to sending troops, that really um, energized me as somebody who was against the war. I really believed that it was wrong, both politically and morally. And as it ramped up and it got closer, it became more of a problem for me. This is while you were in law school. You're yeah, talking about. yeah, and it came. You know, I was. It was like this, you know, like treadmill going into the meat grinder, you know. <laughs> I felt like, you know, I'm getting closer and closer all the time to this thing. And uh, so, you know, uh, I was really strongly against the war. I really was. And, uh, so your involvement with ROTC and becoming commissioned was all happening without your being sort of concerned about actually serving in... I didn't have a problem with serving the army. I didn't know about the Vietnam War. It didn't exist. And uh, I thought there was a very good, strong possibility that I'd go on active duty maybe for six months and then the rest, six and a half years, would be in reserves. And um, it just didn't present either the practical or the moral issue that it became. Right. It, be, it was a very big thing for me. Um, and uh, I was really strongly against the war. Must have been a very strange position to be in, knowing that you were going to have to serve. I remember when uh, it was the spring of 1968, and I was already on active duty I'd been in training, first at the infantry school in the fall of 67 in Georgia, and then at the intelligence school in Baltimore. And just before I was going to California and then to Vietnam in April of 1968, that I was visiting this friend of mine on the Upper West Side near the law school. And uh, I walked out of the law school and there was this big demonstration. They, uh, it was at Mark Rudd, I'm trying to think who it was that uh, they were having a sit-in and holding some dean hostage and it was right there. It was, I think it was Hamilton Hall, right? it was right in front of us. And I remember standing there uh, one week from actually going to California. It was two weeks before I went to Vietnam. Um, um, and really feeling, it was like an out of body experience. And I remember talking to a policeman. I said, what? I said what's going on here? And he was explaining how there was this uh, occupation going on in the building. And uh, I mean, there was a lot of ferment. And I think I, I, I thought, what would, or maybe it was later, I thought, what would have happened if I had graduated in 1965 and I was still in law school when Mark Rudd took over that building? I don't know what would have happened. Uh, but I was already in the army uh, on active duty at that time, and so I was I was very torn. So are you saying that when you were applying for jobs and accepting these jobs, it was for after you, you knew that you were going to have to do this active duty yes period right, right. first before you could actually yeah, and part of the job 
interviews that I was describing was for the summer jobs too. I, I don't remember which interviews were which, but I interviewed on Wall Street, I think, at both times. So what was your position uh, in the Army? I was an intelligence officer. Um, and so after training, uh, I was trained as an intelligence officer at Fort Holabird. Fort? Holabird in Baltimore. It closed the year or two after I left, and they moved uh, the intelligence command and school to Fort Huachuca in New Mexico? Not sure. Uh, and I was sent to infantry school, and I didn't think, I couldn't believe that they would send me to Vietnam because I was a lawyer. And I maintained that for a while. Um, and in infantry school, I uh, got an assignment to Korea, not Vietnam. And uh, I thought I was going to Korea, but uh, midway through uh, intelligence school, uh, my orders were changed to Vietnam. And that's where I went. And I was, um, a, um, was a liaison. Uh, between uh, the American units. I was an advisor, so that meant I lived in the district, village, government compound with, with uh, six or seven other um, American army people who were also advisors. I was the intelligence advisor, and there were other advisors of, for different purposes. And I lived there for a year. And my main function was to collect intelligence from the Vietnamese and uh, supply it to the American units that operated in that area. There was a uh, U.S. Infantry Division stationed. Um, uh, their base camp was two miles away. And so I basically got intelligence. Uh, if it was operational, particularly, that would be handed off to either the units, the Vietnamese units or the American units there. That was my job. Did you feel like you were in personal, physical danger while you were there? From the moment I stepped off the plane <laughs> to the moment I left. <laughs> so a couple of years later, you ended up writing a memoir about your experience in Vietnam. Right, right. Does it have a title? Um, at, at one point, it was called Letters from Koo Chi. I'm actually rewriting it right now. So what impelled you to write a memoir? And what impact would you say, at least briefly, your experience in Vietnam had on you? Well, uh, it was, uh, you know, um, it was trying to work out the the moral dilemma that I felt and uh, trying to reconcile my, reconcile my feelings with my actions. And uh, so it was sort of like an internal accounting. That's, what it was. That's why I wrote it. That's why I wrote it. How did you feel um, Jewishly and in terms of your, sort of your sense of Jewish identity, Jewish this sort of in this during this experience and and afterwards well it was it was pivotal it was absolutely pivotal because um, it made me question the values of america i i really felt i was engaged in something that was immoral and uh sort of started thinking about alternative value systems. And being Jew my Jewish value system was that alternative. So although I really was not observant, I didn't keep kosher, um, I started feeling internally um, the pos a positive being drawn toward being Jewish, starting in Vietnam. And it kind of lay pretty nascent for a while until a year or two after. Mm -hmm. 
Is there any way in which you acted on it during those years? Yeah. A couple of ways. There was a um, chapel at the 25th Infantry Division, Infantry Division Base Camp in Kuchi. And uh, I went to services there on Saturday morning. Uh, I met uh, some other Jewish fellows who were stationed on the base camp. The Minion, Saturday morning Minion was, was run by a dentist and a psychiatrist. And they, they were actually keeping kosher. They roomed together and they got bologna and things like that from the Jewish Welfare Board. Um, you know, shipped to them from the States to keep them. That's that was what the, the meat they ate. You know, there was no way to get kosher meat in Vietnam. Um, and I really valued that. I felt uh, really a sense of home going to the services. And uh, I also went for Rosh Hashanah services to a different base camp about 20 miles away. Uh, so it was kind of like an island of home and uh, different kind of identity that uh, was mixed in with all this fighting and war, death. So, <laughs> um, let's turn now to once you came back from Vietnam um, and how you became involved in Fabrengen and your experience as a member. So what brought you back to Washington, D.C. at the point that you got out of the Army, which was in 60... Uh, 69. 69. Well, I picked a job um, in Washington. I had uh, two... Had a, had a definite job offer at, at the Treasury Department and I had another likely offer from a pretty nice small law firm in New York City. And uh, my best friend and roommate um, at the time, or maybe one of my best friends, was planning to go to Washington. So that was a big factor. Um, and uh, I really wanted to, to do public service. Uh, I thought, really felt like that was my calling, was to, to try to work, make the world a better place and um, that the government was the way to do that. The government was the way to do it. Yes. And Even though the government had engaged you and the American public in this war. Yes, but I did not uh, equate, um, you know, my feelings about Lyndon Johnson and uh, the war uh, with the government in general. Um, but even if I did, which I don't think I did, it didn't deter me from the idea that I could make a difference by working in the government. And I was very interested in foreign policy. I started being interested in foreign policy from the time I was a senior in college. Uh, and um, I really wanted to go into foreign policy. So that's why I took uh, the job at the State Department in, in Second, second year in law school, after the second year, and why eventually picked the job to work in the Treasury Department. It was in, this, in the, um, Depart uh, the uh, Office of International Affairs, in the General Counsel's Office for International Affairs. And uh, so I worked on foreign affairs. It was, you know, banking and uh, international aid. I was working uh, with the World Bank and the similar institutions, regional institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, and so I was involved in foreign policy, international financial policy there. And this, it, was a, it was a kind of a niche, a very small niche in the government. And it was a very nice place to be. Sounds like a good fit. It was, it was a good fit, except for one thing, the Vietnam War. And uh, I, I became, it took a while, 
it took a year or so, but I started um, to feel uncomfortable in the government. And uh, it was at that time that uh, I joined uh, Jews for Urban Justice and that became Verbringen. And it was, I started expressing and you know, living out my anti-warness. <laughs> Through that. <laughs> Through that. How would you describe your Jewish identity at that point as you were just... Pivotal. It was pivoting. It was pivoting. Um, in the... Uh, I had, you know, I had this good, fairly decent background. Not, you know, the best background in the world, but I knew quite a bit. And, but I was, was not practicing pretty much almost any way. Uh, but, uh, and it took me a few times. Uh, I went to one thing, the Freedom Seder, I remember, at GW one year. And uh, it was, I don't know if it was the first year or not, but I don't know, I was turned off. I did. You were turned off? Yeah. I thought I didn't, but I changed. I, I actually um, became much more sympathetic to that viewpoint over the next year. And there were certain events that uh, triggered it. And uh, then my roommate said, why don't you go to a, a, a JUJ meeting? I think you'd find it interesting. And uh, so I went, and uh, it was. I found it fascinating uh, that there were these young people, people, some older, some younger, some the same age, uh, they were talking about Jewish issues, Jewish politics, Israel politics, um, linking the civil rights movement uh, with uh, being Jewish, um, linking, you know, things that are going on in Israel uh, with uh, leftist politics, and uh, I really found it fascinating, interesting, and I got involved. And so this was 70, 71? It was, it was mainly 70, it started in 1970. Your involvement with yeah. JUJ, yeah. which was a couple of years old at that point. Yeah, so a lot of the baggage that JUJ had was already, um, I mean, in the Jewish community, had a lot of negative baggage. Uh, it was already the main things that gave it a bad reputation in the Jewish community what, had already happened. And what were those things? Um, they did a sit-in or some kind of protest at the site of the new JCC in Rockville uh, because the owners were seen as slumlords, or not the owners, but the main funders, funders were seen as slumlords and this kind of thing. And that was a big part of the political ethos was how the Jews weren't um, living up to Jewish values. The ethos, ethos of J.U.J.? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the idea was to bring an alternative way of being Jewish to the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And a politically engaged yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there was a wide spectrum. I wasn't partic particularly comfortable with some of the people uh, some of the views, but I was comfortable enough to 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 be involved. It was it was a way of expressing my outrage at the Vietnam War, which was pretty great. Uh, to what extent was JUJ focused on anti-war activism during that period? A lot. It was it was a lot. Um, I don't remember too. Much. I think it was in J, part of JUJ, when JUJ was still in existence, we planted a tree on the Capitol grounds, a tree of peace or something like that, a tree of peace, a tree of life, something. Um, it wasn't legal <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but I think, I'm not sure, I don't remember specifically, I think the first time I think we had to take it away or something, but then the uh, senator from Alaska, I'm trying to remember his name was, I think with the, I don't remember his name, but he either passed a resolution or something that allowed us to plant the tree. So eventually the tree was planted. I think it got moved at some point. I don't know if it died or it just got moved, uh, but we planted the tree there, we had a ceremony and I was the 
so I wasn't the sole. There, there was actually another Vietnam veteran, my, my close friend, um, um, that was my roommate in, in, in and law was school. Was he also involved in JUJ? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And for Brangen. Um, so, but I kind of became like the member of JUJ who is a former military anti-war Jew. <laughs> Did that give you a certain status or credibility that... Uh, was no, I don't want status, but I think, you know, uh, I was, you know, there were anti-war activities like Vietnam veterans against the war. Uh, during that general period in 1971, there was a mall, there was a camp, camp in. On the mall. On the mall of Vietnam veterans, sleep in or something. And uh, so I was involved in those things. And uh, we... Did you know Kerry, John Kerry? No, but I was aware of what he was doing. Um, but, you know, I was working in the Treasury Department at that time. So, you know, I was still, you know, I was in one world and another world at the same time. It was around that time that I started growing my beard. I grew a beard at that time. And I was thinking of talking about this with my wife this morning. And uh, I think it was kind of an expression of separation. I was trying to separate myself. I was... I was kind of trying to get ready to leave the government. I, and this was kind of like, the longer it got, you know, I was closer. <laughs> and I must have looked a little odd in that environment at the time. And I was getting more and more anti-war and anti-government. I mean, it was a real problem working for Nixon. Were there others in your, in your department or in the Treasury Department in general? No. No, I was the only one. Uh, anyway, where I was, uh, there may have been others. To what extent was Israel a focus of JUJ activism at that point? Uh, the Six Day War had happened if just a few years earlier. Yeah, it was. It was a ma it was a major focus. Um, we were um, sympathetic to the peace camp, um, which was the considered the radical left in Israel uh, at that time, and. Uh, we were sympathetic to, you know, the idea of uh, um, giving back the West Bank and this kind of thing, and uh, and I was. Uh, Had you ever been in Israel? I made my first trip to Israel in uh, 1971. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was a summer. Or, not sure. I went. I. I coordinated it with my uncle, the rabbi that I spoke of, and we spent uh, some time together there. Um, but af after Fabrian had started, I went back um, and spent uh, five and four and a half or five and a half months on the kibbutz. I was at an old pond. I, I took an old pond, and so I worked and was in an old pond learning what Hebrew. Kibbutz Berurot Yitzchak which was a Dati kibbutz, Mizrahi. Where is it? It's near the airport, near Lod. And uh, it was in the winter and spring of 1972. But the, um, the politics of, on Israel was uh, pretty left-wing. But even so, there was a variety of positions uh, from really radical to more moderate within JUJ and Fabrengen. What did, let's focus on JUJ for the moment, but can you talk a little bit about what the range of opinions was from the radical to the more moderate within JUJ? Well, I think some some people were pretty were you know pretty sympathetic with the Palestinians, and others were necessarily you know that much allied, but they felt like like I did. Uh, that Israel should uh, have a uh, uh, more peace-oriented uh, policies and more humanitarian policies. Were there positions JOJ was espousing vis-a-vis -vis what the 
long-term prospects for peace would would entail or what the know, relationship would you know I don't really re I don't really remember much about the details mm -hmm. but uh, they they were espoused positions that I'm I'm uncomfortable with today uh, that I, were so far left yeah that felt anti-Israel or, or not particularly? I don't think they were anti-Israel. I don't think anybody was anti-Israel. Maybe some some people were, but that, that, that definitely wasn't me. Um, so that's why there was this spectrum. I think some people were in fact anti-Israel and it was, or expressed anti-Israel views, at least what was perceived to be anti-Israel. I don't know, in those days, if you were said anything nice about the, the PLO, it was anti-Israel. Because you know that was the days of Black September and uh, hijackings, and you know they were uh, they were terrorists. Um, the or the political Al Fatah and PLO they were terrorist groups, uh, no question about it. Um, and so I was I was not sympathetic with them, but by the same token, I was um, I was sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinians. And uh, I, th I was, I tried to encourage, you know, you know, moderation. And that wasn't a, a very um, popular position in the Jewish community in those days. Even moderation was not considered kosher. Mm -hmm. And so that led to a lot of opposition to JUJ and to Verbrengen among the establishment community. Uh, even though Verbrengen did get a grant this first first year from the JUJ in Washington, from the UJA, from the UJA, yeah. it was the Federation at that time, it, but it lost it for political reasons after one year. Right. So let's go back for a minute. I want to ask you about um, how, in your recollection, Ferengen actually got started, and who the essential yeah. players were yeah. in getting it off the ground. Well. I think the the, the 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 key person who was pushing uh, the idea of a religious component to JUJ was Rob Agus, and and he and he worked with uh, Paul Rutke and David Schneer. I felt I saw them as kind of like a triumvirate of the the, the leaders of the movement within JUJ to uh, to this religious uh, manifestation of JUJ, so to speak. Ultimately, JUJ fell away, and there was no more JUJ. So, it's it's easy to think of the two as separate. But at one point, they weren't separate. Um, and uh, uh, there was at a meeting. There was a meeting, a JUJ meeting, when Rob brought it up. He the said, idea. Yeah, and uh, we talked about it. I believe it was the focus of a retreat that we had in Harper's Ferry in December of 1970. Uh, by then, I think there had been a, uh, pretty much of a decision to start f to start for Brangen. And I don't think the idea initially was that JUJ would go away, but it quickly actually did go away after for Brangen started. Because, because for Brangen became a venue for doing the politics. Uh, it was pro became problematic to do the politics, but it was very political in the beginning. We uh, had a draft resistant counselor, you know, in for writing. And, I mean, how, for some people that was very popular. Uh, and, uh, you know, people came to Washington. They could sleep at Fabrengen for the when they went for the protests. There were anti-war marches. The people stayed at Fabrengen. They slept over there. We had lots of room. Um, these things were not popular. <laughs> no. Do you remember the concept paper for a new Jewish community that was circulated by Rob Agus? I, in general, I do. Um, so, as you said, it was launched with a $15,000 grant for six months, uh, a grant from the UJA, so from the South. Was it $15,000? 15000 It's funny, I think of it as being 50000 Fifty. 50? Yeah, but that just is my faulty memory. You, you yeah. remember it better than I do. Um, so, in, in his book, uh, Torn at the Roots, do you know Michael Staub's book? He has, no. Um, he writes that most people at the time accepted the idea that Verbrengen was the non-political part of JUJ. 
um, and that others felt that J.U.J. sort of became for, for Brengen. What do you think about the relationship between the two? How I think you that's it? I think that's accurate. Which? Oh, well, there was a distinction there. That that, for Brengen was the non-political part of J.U.J. So they were two distinct. I think initially that was the thought. But then it sort of morphed. Yourself. Uh, but then really, the J.U.J. people became for Brengen, and there was no more J.U.J. It didn't take very long. Mm -hmm. What was the relationship of J.U.J. and for Brengen to uh, the Jewish Federation that was providing the funds in the beginning? Were there tensions there from the beginning? Uh, you know, Rob, Rob really was the person dealing with J.U.J. Uh, UJ Federation. Uh, We'd been talking before we took a, a lunch break about the relationship between J.U.J. and Fabrengen and um, I wanted to ask you what uh, your recollections are of the relationship between J.U.J. Fabrengen and the Jewish establishment, the organized Jewish community at that point. There were elements uh, of the established community, um, meaning the Federation community and the Jewish Community Council community, um, that was afraid of us. Um, and um, they, they uh, were watching us and um, there were articles about us in the Jewish Week and... Um, what was the tenor of the articles? Very negative. And what was the critique? That we were outposts for the Palestinians, El Fatah, and there was an article, it was called, El Fatah Goes to Shul. <laughs> Does that say it all? <laughs> In your recollection, were there any, basically, conditions or strings attached to the, the $15,000 grant that the that UJA gave for bringing to get off the ground, in terms of the kinds of activities uh, Fabrengen could engage in, or the relationship between Fabrengen and J.U.J., anything to, in that vein? I'm afraid I don't. It's possible. I think Rob is the best person about that. You've already talked to him. Mm -hmm. um, but he would be more aware of it than I was, because he was the one that was the interface. He got the money, and he did all the negotiations. Uh, at one point, when we lost our funding, or were about to lose our funding, uh, we had a hearing at the Federation office, uh, and they had a, they had a committee, and uh, it was three people, uh, and we gave testimony about Verbrangen to try to defend ourselves. And uh, it was interesting because the committee recommended continuation of funding, but the board of the Federation rejected it, and they cut it off. On what grounds, given that recommendation? Uh, that they, they felt, I mean, they didn't miss any words. They, they said that this is not the kind of activity that the Jewish community should be funding. Mainly because of the... The political. The, the political and pro-Palestinian aspects of... The, the just, the, the, I don't, you know, maybe they said it was pro-Palestinian, but I think it was more uh, you know, peace-oriented, uh, you know, the f criticism of Israel that wasn't tolerated in those days. Yeah. And it was something that uh, Fabrengen got funding, and it may be that Rob made representations but uh, about what it would be, and now that I'm thinking about it, uh, it seems to ring a bell that it was going to be religious and, um, you know, that was the primary purpose. There might be some politics, but uh, my recollection is not solid on that. Okay. Were you involved with Fabrengen from, from the very outset? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Um, so the, this new community was called the Fabrengen Jewish Free Culture Center. What was the meaning behind the name? Where did Fabrengen come from? If you had asked me what the name was, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. <laughs> I would have said, yes, yeah, Fabrengen. I didn't remember any, any of that the other rest, part. The uh, what did, what did Fabrengen mean? Well, to me, and I think to Rob, and uh, I'll stop there. It was uh, coming together, which is what it means r r uh, literally. In Yiddish. In Yiddish. And uh, it was, well, now I'm just lighting the name and the purpose together, uh, it, which was uh, a new way, a new way of coming together uh, uh, to renew uh, Jewish values and uh, to live a holistic, we use that word a lot, holistic Jewish life. And, you know, it was used with, by Rob, I think, with reference to the Farbrangans of the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rabbi. Um, and it emphasized, or at least it connoted, this Hasidic flavor of um, Nigunim and uh, Jewish feeling that everybody was equal um, in Judaism and that uh, you didn't have to be a learned person. You could uh, to experience uh, the holiness in, in Judaism and uh, Jewish life. Uh, why was the decision made not to use the word Chavra in the name? Do you know? Uh, you'd have to ask Rob. I, I don't know. <laughs> he gave it the name. Okay. Um, to what extent would you say you and others involved in the beginnings of Fabrengen were aware of um, the existence of Chavara Shalom in Boston and the New York Chavara in Boston and held them as some kind of a model? Um, we were very aware. We were very aware of them and we felt of them as, you know, sister organizations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with, and we were together, a kind of a community of sorts. We, but the we understood also that the character of uh, our organization and those two were different. Awesome. And each, each of those were different from each other. Uh, well, first of all, Chavar Shalom was, as, they, as we were talking about before, uh, a seminary. Uh, community seminary, and it was more of a scholarly kind of uh, an organization. Um, New York Havara, I really did never got a firm grasp as to what it was, uh, but it also had you know links to the seminary in New York, the Jewish Theological Seminary. It seemed to me, uh, people who were uh, graduates went there, or people who were going to school there went there, and it, you know it was very close uh, on the Upper West Side. Uh, whereas we were overtly political. We were in Washington. And that gave us a, a different character from those. Although they may have been political, not in the same way and not as much, I don't think. Mm -hmm. We were really active politically. You know, there were things to do here you couldn't do in New York or Boston. Right. And we did. We did those things. <laughs> We're going to come to those shortly. Um, both for Brengen, uh, excuse me, both Chavarat Shalom and the New York Chavarat were membership organizations that membership communities where uh -huh. people had to apply and be accepted uh, in order to become okay. part of the community how how did uh, for Brengen envision how it would sort of create this community mm -hmm. and who would become part of it there was none of that no such thing as you know applying for membership you could Anybody could be part of it, and all you had to do was to come to be part of it, um, and you were welcome. The whole idea behind it, I think, and this was, I think, Rob's idea, but I think I certainly subscribed to it, and most people did, was that it was a way for people to experience Jewish community who were repelled or turned off by organized Jewish life or Jewish communities that they that were out there or they were familiar with and to uh, bring them back 
to a kind of a Jewish experience uh, into Ju- Judaism. And we, in a sense, were much more egalitarian yeah. and less hierarchical. We, you know, I was thinking about this, and I don't think there was, I don't remember for sure, but I don't remember, you know, a hierarchical structure even within it. You know, in terms of, you know, somebody was president, somebody was vice president. I don't remember any of that. There might have been, but I, I can't remember that. And it certainly wasn't a big part of it, you know. There was a leadership group, you know, and there were people who did certain functions. Uh, but, uh, you know, I thought of some the other groups as much more elitist. Uh, so, um, was there um, an emphasis on... Hello? So, how, how would you describe the, the sort of backgrounds and um, uh, diversity of the of the community, uh, the people who did become involved in in for in, in that very beginning period, it was very diverse. I think the Rob was certainly the best educated Jewishly, being a rabbi's son, and he kind of took a lead in that way. Um, Arthur Wasco was certainly the most political. And he, he was, in fact, the only real public figure, people that, a person that people knew outside of our group. I, I think he was really the only one. And so he had a, a reputation and a visibility. Uh, and he was, you know, very politically uh, involved f- through the Urban Institute. No, not the Urban Institute. The... Um, What's the name of it? It'll come to me. But there was an institute that he he was part of. He was a fellow there. It still exists. It's a left wing uh, kind of think tank. And uh, I think when Raskin, I forget his first name, was part of that. But um, okay, so and the rest of us uh, were, you know. Let's see. When did when did Max and Esther Tickton yeah. come on the well, scene? Yeah. Well, Max w- Max was not one of the founders. I think it was exactly. a, about a year, maybe 72, 73. Uh, I remember the first time he attended anything in Fabrang. It happened to be at the uh, at my house. And it was Sukkot and we had services in the Sukkah that uh, in in my backyard. Uh, and that was his first uh, time in Fabrang. And, uh, you know, he was an assistant or an associate director of Hillel at the time. And um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I I think it was Parsha that you read from from Zechariah, where the the Gog and Magog uh, have the war that's in the Haftorah. Uh, So it was, I think, Shabbat Sukkot or something like that. Anyway, so he, he joined later, but being a rabbi and a political activist uh, and having a wife that Esther, who was also equally involved, uh, they immediately became, you know, an important part of the group, right. adding something yeah. substantial that we didn't have before. Right. But there were many other kinds of people that... Uh, came from a wide variety, this is what you're asking, yes. a wide variety of backgrounds, some with very little Jewish uh, education or involvement. Uh, for the most part, it was that kind of person, or there might, like what, there was one person who, who became a friend of mine, ours, um, who was the president of uh, the um, National Synagogue Youth, of the conservative movement. Mm-hmm. He was the national, pr- he was, he was the national president. Uh, so there were people that had, you know, been involved in Jewish life. But it was a, 
it attracted all kinds of people. Um, so what kinds of activities did Verbrengen offer uh, as it was getting off the ground? And what were you most involved in? Hmm. Well, I wasn't involved in the draft counseling or anti-draft counseling. Um, although a fraternity brother moved from New York, uh, became uh, the, the, the lawyer who was doing that work for Verbrengen. What, what was that work? It was uh, advising people who wanted to get out of the draft. People in the community or people with kids? Among the membership? Uh, uh, anybody. People became involved because of that, or maybe they just came for that. Um, I, I, would you repeat the question? The, the kinds of activities that okay, Fred activities. Was, was offering in the very beginning. Well, that was something we did from the beginning. We hosted uh, people who were visiting for anti-war demonstrations, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, we had classes. I remember Rob's father spoke early on. The, we had a, an opening night um, festi festival or something in which Shlomo Karbach gave a concert. We had a poster. Paul Rutke did a, a silkscreen poster, which I have a copy of somewhere. Oh, that when that I, would be wonderful to have. Oh, yeah. you don't have that? Mm -hmm. um, um, what do you remember about that? Can you describe that? Not, not really. Well, just even a little bit. Do you remember anything about it? Well, I know that Shlomo uh, sang, and uh, it was, it was a very heavily attended event. It was a very joyous. Um, I'm sure there was singing and dancing, and uh, it was on a February night in uh, in 1971. I forget. So right at the beginning. It was the first event. It's the first event. The very first event of Forbringen. You I, said I, opening event, that's what you mean. Yes. It was it was the opening. It was Was there a crowd? A very large crowd. We attracted huge numbers of people. It was it it caught on very, very quickly. And we had big crowds every Friday night. Um, so what was what would happen on Friday nights? We would have a communal meal after services. We would have Kabbalat Shabbat in the, the evening service. We would meet in the up. There was an upstairs uh, uh, living room, and so it was, this was in the Fabrengen house that you rented with the money. Yeah, it was on Florida family. Avenue. It was, a, it was a three or four story house, and uh, it was right next to the Cosmos Club. And, and coincidentally, and there was lots of space. There was space for offices and for meeting rooms. And there was a kitchen, of course. Uh, and we would have services in the upstairs living room. Everybody would sit on the floor. We had one or two guitars. Uh, David Schneer usually led the service. Rob would, you know, do his part in the service. Uh, and as time went on, I got the hang of it. And if, if uh, for some reason or other, David wasn't around, or maybe in addition to David, I would, I would lead services. I had, a, I had a guitar, and I played the guitar, and I would lead. That was really one of the highlights for me. We had... You know, so, so describe how the evening would go. So it would start with Kabbalah Shabbat, and how would it start? Just singing. You know, there'd be just the humming, the gunim, getting into the mood, people getting into the spirit of Shabbat, to welcome Shabbat. And uh, after uh, the, there were certain kind of songs we would sing, like Esa Enai or Mi Ha'ish, uh, and probably some others, which I don't remember. And then um, we would do the, ex the regular Kabbalah Shabbat service. And you, we would sing a lot of Karl Bach melodies to that, which you know, I'll get to later in this. Or how, what that was, what what yes. happened with that? Yes. Uh, that's another subject, really. But um, and then we would have the service, and sometimes we had themes, like, we, or not necessarily themes, but there were thematic elements. But we would ask people to do some kind of contribution of their own. You know, there were some people who didn't know the prayer book. But one woman was a, was a dancer, so she was encouraged to dance. 
So instead of giving a Devar Torah or singing, or she would dance. And um, that kind of thing it was very open and very freewheeling um, and designed to allow people to express themselves and to get into the spirit of Shabbat and to do their thing if they had something to contribute, even if it wasn't something that the other people were doing. So I remember later on, a few years later, when we were meeting at the Religious Action Center, or the Reform Movement, the uh, Shlo, uh, uh, Shalom, Shlomo Shak, uh, Zalman. Zalman Shakter, he did a dance service. It was completely dance for Shabbat, for Kabbat Shabbat. I, I was a little bit iffy about that whole thing, but I mean, we, we were up to that. <laughs> it, was, it was not completely set in stone at all. Um, and so you can see how it was open. Yeah. It was designed to bring people in. And, uh, and for, for, for a year at least, it was like that. When we moved to uh, um, more confined quarters, it became rather crowded. And that led to something, I'll get to that later. But you were asking what we were doing in the, in the beginning. So we were doing that. We were doing study Shabbat uh, morning study and services? I don't remember now, to tell the truth, where we had services, but I know we had a study session. We would study the Torah, which we had been doing at JUJ, too. Um, but it moved into this building. We often were meeting, I remember meeting there more than once, maybe it was often, at Arthur Wasco's home on Wyoming Avenue Street um, for the Torah discussion. And those were really fantastic discussions. You know, now, from my point of view, they were quirky. But then it was extremely exciting to hear people uh, make, bring the Torah portion alive and to see different things in themselves in the Torah reading and to express what they were feeling about those things. And it gave new dimensions to... to the, the, the Hamash and, and, and Judaism. So did they bring contemporary issues into those discussions a great deal? That yes, but more, more often personal feelings, the way they felt about themselves. That was one of the things that sometimes bothered me, but other times didn't, was how personal people would get. Very revealing. Do you give it was the felt more, well, it, you know, it, it would feel like a little like, my, like a therapy session sometimes. People would bring their personal problems into the into it, and you know, share them with us. And sometimes that was uncomfortable, but we were always supportive, and um, but that happened. Um, when did things like the uh, coffee house that uh, Fabrenga offered get off the ground? Had poetry readings and speaker series, those kinds of things. I think pretty much in the beginning. I, I think I, the most active period was in the beginning. The most activities we had was in the beginning because we had all this space and we had all this energy just flowing out and all these people who were interested. I mean, as I said, right away it was very popular. And once people knew about it, they came and they came back. How many people would be there on a typical Kabbalat Shabbat Friday evening service and meal? Well, it ranged, and I don't, couldn't say for sure, uh, but it would be like 50 or more, 75. I don't think it was probably more than 75. If it was 100, I don't know. But it, it could get pretty crowded. But it was also so great. And, and after the service, we... Um, we served the communal meal that everybody pitched in, you know, had a, maybe I would, one, one week I would make a tuna casserole and for, you know, 50 people. <laughs> and, uh, and another time somebody else would do the meal and, you know, we had three meals. And that always is an attraction. Indeed. <laughs> So, and then afterward, I don't remember exactly what happened, but we probably hung around and talked, or somebody pulled out a guitar and we sang. Uh, 
And if we had visitors, you know, there was a lot of schmoozing late into the night. It was free form. You know, and I, I look at, we uh, used a, uh, at some point, David Schneer uh, introduced a high holiday, a loose leaf high holiday, alternative high holiday prayer book. And uh, I remember it was, at, it was our prayer book. We used it several years. And now I look at it and I say, gee, we were really pretty quirky. <laughs> what was in there that made you feel that looking back on well, it? Well, it was every, you know, it was not just the, the traditional things, it was, it was non Jewish things and uh, um, variety of things. Oh, and one of the, one of the members was uh, an artist. And uh, he did drawings. And the drawings would get in there uh, in different things. And uh, I know he did. Uh, Where's that book? Uh, let me see. I'll show you the book. Oh, he 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 designed this, I think. Here, we'll hold up the this. So this is the um, this is the for bringing newsletter. I think that's his drawing. Uh, Call Shechvi, I think that is, and he is a present on my birthday, or maybe it was for my wedding. He designed a bookmark for for a series of bookmarks with different drawings. And he, oh. he was the illustrator of the first Jewish catalog. What's his name? Stuart Copens. Yeah. Do you want me to take that? Yeah, yeah. Very nice. So, uh, as I said, different people had different things to offer. Um, so what kinds of political activism was Fabregan engaged in in, that, in those early months? Well, 1971 was very active anti-war activity going on in Washington. I know that, as I mentioned to you, the, the Vietnam veterans of, uh, against the war encampment on the Mall took place in, in April of 1971. Were you part of that? I, I was, and s some other people were too. Uh, and there were anti-war marches. You know, to tell you the truth, the last one I really remember was 1969, but there must have been ones after that. Uh, a lot of the political activity was about the war. And uh, we, as I said, we hosted people coming into town for that. We had classes, Rob taught classes, and uh, we had visiting people, rabbis come in. Uh, we had regular classes. Was there an anti-war rally, rally in 1971, this was after Fabrengen got started in, in Washington, D.C., a big one? There might have been. There might have been. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. There was another thing that happened, and you probably heard this from somebody else, was that the musicians that played, uh, uh, David Schneer formed a group, a trio, called the Fabrengen Fiddlers. Mm -hmm. You probably heard of that. And um, included at least one other member of Fabrengen. Maybe were, all three were members of Fabrengen. And they became their own kind of entity. At first, they were just the musicians of Fabrengen or something, but then they became, you know, it's probably a name that David thought up, Fabrengen Fiddlers, and it became a group. They recorded albums and they started doing gigs, and I don't know if they still exist, but um, for a long time they did play at different things, Jewish folk, folk festivals, and weddings and bar mitzvahs and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I want to now sort of delve into some of the uh, activities and uh, program of Fabrengen after that first six month period. So when after the, the Federation had cut off its funding um, and Fabrengen thereafter moved to a to a smaller building is that correct right we i think we moved more than once um the place that i remember was um 1621 27th street something like that it was in um in um what do they call that area it's um near the uh what's the called the wardman hotel 1627 21st Street. 21st, oh, I got it yeah. backwards. 21st Street. It was near the big hotel there, uh, lower, the south, just south of the zoo. I can't think of the, uh, what they call that area. This is the winter of 72. Yeah, it was, it was um, perhaps. And mm -hmm. it was a row house. There was much less room there. 
and uh, we were still drawing big crowds. And then it started getting very crowded. Uh, but, oh, 1627 21st Street. Mm -hmm. But I think I have a recollection of moving. Uh, maybe that's when we were down near the Phillips Gallery. We moved to a place near the Phillips Gallery, and then after that, we moved to this um, part place up Connecticut Avenue. So that was the third place, and um, I guess it was the second place when it was maybe it was Twenty First Street because I'm not sure what, what the address means. Uh, near the Phillips, it was uh, close to the Religious Action Center on Massachusetts Avenue. Um, I just remember thinking, this is oppressive. We have too many people. We can't fit. People can't get comfortable. Can't people can't really feel apart. People are forced to the per periphery. And I brought up at meetings, uh, you know, we should do something about this. People are are going to not be feel a part enough of the community because we just can't absorb in that space uh, the people, all the people are coming in and they'll come in and they'll kind of go away. Uh, and our, you know, we saw it as a way for people getting involved and kind of like as an organizing tool for a new kind of Jewish community. And I, I proposed and I felt it was important to allow other people to feel this feeling and the experience that we had as the original members of the Fabrengen, and you can't do that with 50 or 75 people, and that we should allow satellites to get started. It didn't fly. People didn't like that. I had other proposals that, that I'd like to bring up. Uh, I don't know what's in your, in your uh, Please, order, but I was interested in communal life. I, um, in the spring of 1971, I, I was a government attorney. Did I mention that? I worked for the Treasury Department. And I quit my job in protest. I just couldn't work in, this, in the Nixon administration anymore. And uh, I wanted to start a kind of a kibbutz. Uh, an and, urban kibbutz. Well, not so urban. Not so urban. Uh, and we, I remember going out to, uh, you know, southwestern uh, Virginia and looking and visiting a commune there to see what they were doing and uh, I was interested in doing something like that. I had quit my job. I was not working anymore and uh, I was looking for a kind of total commitment to this new holistic life that other people weren't ready. There wasn't a single other person. person who quit their job or was interested in this kind of radical change in their lifestyle. And it didn't go anywhere. But I investigated. One of the reasons I went to Israel during, in the winter of 72, was that this proposal had been rejected. And I was wanted to look again and see what, what I could find in Israel on an Israeli kibbutz. And uh, that was one of the motivation fa motivating fa factors. One was to see how it would work for purposes of transplanting it in, in the Washington general area. Uh, and also just to experience it because I wasn't getting to experience it the way I looked forward to it. And again, I, during this period, I was not working. And uh, So what was the experience like for you in Israel? On, uh, and what kibbutz, can you repeat what kibbutz you were on? I was on kibbutz Berot Yitzchak. And I got out of it what I expected, hoped to get out of it in a way. Uh, if you read the article that uh, I gave you, it, it's, a newsletter. It, it's, it's, it's complex. Uh, Can you tell us the highlights though? Well, I, I learned what it was to live in a, um, a total Jewish environment, in a total communal environment, in a religious environment. But I also saw that it wasn't the ideal community that I was looking for, that there were a lot of real people there with real failings, <laughs> political, social, family, and uh, imperfections, uh, values that weren't necessarily consistent with mine. And it was kind of like, and that's what the article says, it was... Uh, Hello. 
it, it was a um, kind of a reality check. <laughs> but I learned a lot. Uh, I wasn't particularly happy there. One reason was I, I got mono after about three weeks. And that kind of tinged the rest of the experience because I was sick a lot of the time. Uh, but, you know, the things that I learned and experienced there were very valuable and, and stayed with me. Such as? Uh, what a um, full, sh full Shabbat, what a full holiday was, what, uh, what uh, davening in an Orthodox environment was, learning the service completely, in, uh, different services. So religiously, it was a big education. I learned Hebrew. Um, I was Kita Aleph, but I learned a lot in four and a half months or five months, whatever it was. All that was, was an, um, I valued a great deal. And it, uh, at what point did you meet your wife, who's Israeli? Uh, I met her, <coughs> excuse me, in the fall, in the summer of 1974, so which was later. two years later. Uh, although when I, later on, when I was, uh, you know, working for this Jewish organization, the Synagogue Council's think tank, I would get introduced, I remember getting introduced by somebody in Great Lake, Long Island, the synagogue that actually I went to for pre-bar mitzvah uh, one year, uh, Great Neck, and being introduced by uh, this leader, who was actually at that time a national Jewish leader. And I had dinner with him before I spoke at the synagogue. And he asked me, you know, how I met my wife. And uh, when he introduced me, he, he said, you know, that I met my wife on a kibbutz, which was not true. And I told him that I had met him in Washington. Met her, 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 I'm yeah. sorry, her in Washington. Yeah. And um, through a uh, Fabregan friend. I see. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't during this period that, that you were actually on the No, I, yeah. it was toward the end of the time I was with Fabregan that uh, I met her. Did you come back from Israel or leave Israel feeling like you could bring some of what you had learned and your, uh, did you, what were your feelings about trying to live in a total immersive communal Jewish environment after your kibbutz experience? Frankly, I don't remember, but if I can kind of try to imagine it, I think that I probably was bringing back what's in that article, which was the ideal and the reality of living communally. I, I no longer, I think my eyes were a little bit more open to the difficulties and the downsides of living communally. And um, I wanted to share my experiences with him in that article, shows that I did. Um, and other than that, specifically, I don't remember, but it, gave my Hebrew knowledge and my religious knowledge a depth that it didn't do, have before, and I hope that it contributed to what I was able to offer people when I was in Fabrengen. So you came back in 72? Yeah, it was summer of 72 I came back. And got reinvolved with Fabrengen at that point? Yes. And did what professionally? Well, I had left my job, so I was looking for work. Mm -hmm. In the summer when I came back, I came back uh, just during uh, hurricane, uh, tro tropical storm Agnes, I think it was. It rained for seven straight days and nights. <laughs> there was a tremendous flood. Uh, and that was what greeted me when I, it was odd because when I went to Israel uh, in February, it rained torrentially for the month, first month I was there also. <laughs> so I don't know what kind of sign that was, but, um, so I worked for Ralph Nader. I, I got a job paying almost nothing, uh, working on the so-called Congress Project, uh, which later became the Congress Watch, which was a, became a permanent organization. But the Congress, um, what did I say it was called? Uh, project. <laughs> project was a study of the U.S. Congress and, it, it, and the way it functioned or malfunctioned. And I was given um, the DC District of Columbia Committee 
and the subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee for the District of Columbia. And I was to interview people and write up a report. It was going to be part of a book. And there was a large staff. And I remember meeting Ralph Nader when I first started. And um, I wrote what I thought was really a very interesting uh, report about how the, the District of Columbia uh, uh, governance by the Congress worked, or you know, sometimes not to the benefit of the District of Columbia. But it was never published. They said it would be published, but they never published it. The only thing, Mark Green, who was uh, one of the directors of the program, he later became an official in New York City. He published a book based on that research, but that was the only thing I published. And then during the summer, a, a member for Brangen, who was also a, a journalist, um, called me up and told me that uh, he knew somebody who was starting, uh, who's becoming director of this Jewish think tank of the synagogue council. And would I be interested? Can you say what was the synagogue council? The synagogue council was the umbrella organization of the Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox congregational and rabbinical organizations. So that it was an organization of organizations, six organizations. Now people might wonder how such an organization ever existed because there's very little contact between Orthodox and Conservative now. And the organization disbanded in 1994. And the, the Synagogue Council Institute is called the Institute for Jewish Policy Planning and Research of the Synagogue Council of America. Um, started in fall of 72 in Washington. And I, Ira Silverman was the director and I was the research director. This was a brand new organization. It was a brand new organization. The name had existed uh, in New York for a while and there had been a director, but he got seriously ill. In any case, they moved it to Washington. Philip Klusnick found, funded it with uh, uh, seven or six of his friends over a three-year period. So it had a nice funding base. And it was to bring serious uh, uh, research, journalism, and academic studies to the issues of Jewish life in America and elsewhere. And at the time, it was unique. Actually, I don't think there's anything like it now or since. But that was in the days at the very, very beginning of the Association for Jewish Studies and Jewish Studies programs generally. In universities. In universities, right. And I remember the, the newsletter. I joined the organization. I spoke there uh, on at least one occasion. And the newsletter was a, a mimeograph. And... Uh, in the very beginning, and it was a rather small organization, and it became a mammoth organization, just like the number of Jewish studies program became mammoth in the, in the country. Uh, but at the very beginning, there wasn't a, people weren't doing academic, serious research about Jewish issues. You had a kind of a Jewish press that was not very critical, not very far seeing, and what we attempted to do was to examine various issues that were affecting Jewish life in America uh, from, a, from a serious, sometimes critical perspective. And it was the perfect job for me. It was like a dream come true. Because when I came back from Israel, I wanted to do something to change and improve the Jewish community in America. And that, and since I'm primarily interested in intellectual things and writing, uh, rather than say politics as such, you know, becoming a politician, it was perfect for me because it allowed me to, um, to address wide variety of issues that I thought need being need to be addressed and I address such things as um, 
Jews and cults. That was a big thing in those days, Jews joining ashrams. Um, possibility of negotiations with the PLO, which was a very hot topic in the Synagogue Council. And uh, to this day, I'm amazed that it actually got published. It was very controversial. And I'm, I'm not sure how it actually happened that it got published because it was a very, I wouldn't say it was sympathetic, but it listened to the most moderate and, and gave the views of the most moderate of the Palestinians. And I posed the question in that article about maybe there's a place to talk to these people. Maybe, you know, there's an element there that we should be open to talking to because it wasn't, it, it was anathema in those days because their biggest expression in those days was killing people, murdering people. Um, and um, I did a, this came later, I think it was like 1974, I did a study of Soviet Jewish immigration. Um, really soup to nuts, um, covered every, every aspect, including the likelihood that there would be thousands, tens of thousands of Soviet Jews coming to the United States, which is what happened. Um, and so just as a, a part of that, it wasn't a small part, but a, a major part of that article was to examine whether the social service agencies that were dealing with immig immigration of Soviet Jews was up to the task. What were they doing and what needed to change? And that part of the art, the article itself was rather long. It was like, I don't know, it was long, seven to 10,000 words. It got republished in Israel. In, they translated it into Hebrew and republished my article in um, Devar's weekend edition. Devar doesn't exist anymore, but it was a big newspaper, Labor, it was the Labor Zionist uh, newspaper in those days. At that time, it was one of the major ones. And, um, but the part of it that um, uh, got uh, interest uh, was, uh, particularly was what I had to say about Jewish organizations handling of immigrants, immigrants, and which I was very critical of. Um, and the New York Federation invited me up, for example, to, to, to speak to them about it because they were the funding, funders of these Jewish settlement, resettlement organizations. And it uh, resulted in an a overhaul of what they were doing and who was, who was doing it. So you felt like you were having an impact. I did have an impact. I not only felt it, I did have an impact. Our, our publication was called Analysis. And it was circulated to 3,000 rabbis and um, academics at various Jewish academics and Jewish institutions and academic institutions. There weren't that many, but to congressmen. It went to political leaders. And, you know, I wrote similar articles, shorter ones, for the National Jewish Monthly, uh, which were basically condensed versions of these longer research papers. And uh, B'nai B'rith at that time had 500,000 members. So 500,000 people got the B'nai B'rith Jewish Monthly National Jewish Monthly, I never once, and I had several of these articles uh, done in, in the National Jewish Monthly, I didn't get a single letter in, from, from that audience of 500,000 people. Whereas for analysis, I used to get lots and lots of letters from academics, rabbis. It had a big impact. What's your interpretation of why the general community didn't respond to you? Maybe they don't read the, the, the journal. <laughs> I don't be. know. Uh, but that was a conundrum to me that, you know, you would think one article, one letter to the editor, one month, but, but over, what was it, 72 to 77, I must have written three or four articles that were republished in there. Nothing. Whereas in, to the analysis publications, I used to get all these letters from various people saying, you know, how helpful it was or whatever it was. And uh, so... Who would read the, the analysis publication? 
Who were the readers? Well, as I said, it went to 3,000 rabbis. Rabbis. It went to the mailing list of the Synagogue Council of America. And they were the ones that cir circulated. They, okay. they were the ones that mailed it out. And that was the primary audience. Um, you know, it was the majority of the printed uh, versions. But I got, for example, I did a study of Jewish hospitals and whether Jewish hospitals ought to exist as Jewish hospitals. And what's the point of having a Jewish hospital? The question was presented in those days, but why do we need Jewish hospitals anymore? Because Jewish doctors don't have, are, are, are admitted to practice in regular hospitals. The reason there were Jewish hospitals was to allow Jewish doctors to practice medicine in the hospital setting in the days of strong anti-Semitism um, in academia and in those fields. But that wasn't the true of the in the 70s anymore. So people were saying, well, why are we funding these uh, organizations? And so that was the question I examined. And what I found was that, um, well, it's true that 90 or 85 percent of the budgets from these Jewish hospitals comes from federal funds or state funds. There's this 10 to 15 percent of discretion of money that comes from philanthropy that isn't tied to anything, to service or anything. And from that, research is done and advances in medicine are made. And so the article made the point that this is valuable. It's, you know, it's true. All these other things that people are saying is, are true. But it makes these Jewish hospitals make a contribution to society and to Jewish life. Well, I just give you one example. I got a letter from one of the administrators of, the Jew, of a Jewish hospital. And he, he asked me, you know, how big a staff did you have doing this? You know, I interviewed every, the directors of every Jewish hospital. It was quite a few, maybe 24 of them. And, he said, well, tell me, how many, how many people worked on this with you? And I said, well, actually, nobody. <laughs> so, um, and I would get letters from, you know, people with Jewish chair, uh, Jewish academic chairs and things like that. It was very, very gratifying to see people reading it and thinking it was valuable. Yeah. So you'd come back to D.C., gotten involved in this incredibly important and meaningful work to you, um, where you felt you were having an impact. For Brengen was also supposed to be a way in which the Jewish community was experimenting with uh, creating change and having an impact in a different kind of a way. Yes. Um, so I want to go back to talking about that um, in some more depth, but um, how are you feeling about For Brengen as you were sort of re-entering it uh, post your Israel experience and at the time that you were also getting involved in this very meaningful and impactful work uh, yeah. through your professional life? They were complementary. Huh. And for example, I did an article in analysis about the Chavara movement and, it's, and what it had to teach to synagogues and, and synagogue life. And that was widely read and commented upon. And, you know, just generally, the Jewish press picked up these articles and, you know, summarized them and so on and forth. So it did have an impact. But anyway, to get to the Fabrengan part was that it was complementary. It was a way uh, of living out some of these um, things that I, I hope to create. Did you come back from Israel feeling like it was possible or possible for you to be part of a holistic Jewish yes. community? Yes. Yes. Um, what did you want from for Brengen at that point? I'm not sure much changed at first. Uh, and this was when I came back was summer of 72. What changed was that when the October war came in 70, fall of 73, and I saw people's reaction to it, I realized that I wasn't in the same place politically as most of the people in Fabrengen. So this is the Yom Kippur War. Yeah. How, how it was Yom, Yom Kippur of 73. 
-hmm. And uh, I, it was the beginning of my pulling away from Fabringen. What happened? What, what were the differences in your, where you were and where most of Fabringeners were? Well, I, I don't remember exactly, but I was much more pro-Israel than people around me were. And I don't remember the exact expressions of it or how it was manifested, but I started feeling uncomfortable that some of the views that were being expressed about Israel's position in the war and its defense um, were not my, were not, they didn't speak for me. And uh, at the same time, I was, because I was doing this other thing for the Synagogue Council, I was getting increasingly involved in interacting with the wider Jewish community. And I saw that there was change going on in the Jewish community at large. A, lo a big factor in that was Yitzhak, Rabbi Yitzhak Greenberg. And he became um, like the, the rabbi in residence of the Federation. He, he was turning people on, especially young leadership of the Federation, to Judaism. And, uh, you know, people were starting kosher kitchens of their own. and becoming more Jewish, and the Federation was becoming more interested in Judaism and, and Jewish education, and the kinds of things that I wanted, the things that I was, in fact, everybody in the, in the Havara movement, I think, wanted was reform. I mean, if you recall, there was some kind of uh, demonstration or something at, I think it was the 1969 Federation Convention. In Boston. In Boston. And... Um, that was kind of like the beginning of this new Jews kind of thing. And that became this title of a book by... Jim Sleeper. Right, Jim Sleeper. And um, so we were kind of like the new Jews. And, but I sensed that there was something to, to accomplish within the wider Jewish community that Fabrengen was pulling away from or not integrating itself with politically and in other ways. And we still, still had this very anti-establishment position and not the position on Israel that I was starting to feel. Yeah. So it sounds like the position on Israel became um, somewhat of a, a wedge issue, so to speak, for you. Um, yes, yes. In regard to Fabregas. Yes. After, after your return, you start, and you're saying that you'd been back for about a year ish when the Yom Kippur War took place. A little more, yes. Right? Yeah. And then right. it was a year later. Right. And so, you know, I didn't leave for Brangen until, I don't know, 74, 75, I think. It's about some, somewhere in there. I know, I know I was still involved in 74 because that's when I went, met my wife and we went to Fabrengen together and we went to the retreat. There was a national, not a national, it was a kind of like a retreat of, of the three, Weiss's farm, yeah. uh, of the three Havarot, the right. New York Havara and the right. Boston, the Havarot yeah. Shalom. Okay. And, um, and I, I went along and she didn't go with me, but she was there. And then um, we visited uh, with uh, the Strasfelds and so on. Uh, went to the New York Havara afterward for Sukkot, went to their minion. Um, so I know that when she first came, which was the summer of 74, that uh, I was still involved. Yeah. But exactly when I kind of like started doing other things, I got involved in other things. Uh, I got involved in two other small group kind of, uh, you could say Havarot, but one was actually was a Havara in Addis Israel. I was involved in the very early stages. And when did that start? 72. So that had already started while you were at Fabrengen, very much yes, at Fabrengen. Yes, yeah. And I was involved a little bit, but I wasn't one of the people that started it. When I found out about it, I started going occasionally. I think Rabbi Harold White was one of the people that started it. And there were some people who I still am friendly with uh, at Addis Israel that, that started it. Mm -hmm. And that still exists. And we have off and on been involved with it. And I used, for a long time, uh, we went. Uh, I read Torah regularly when I went, uh, but 
about a year or two ago, I stopped driving on Shabbat. So I stopped going. I, I tried walking uh, a year or so ago once, and it was, I don't know, it was like four miles or more, six miles in each direction. And uh, it was for an occasion. I went for an anniversary of one of our friends. I, and I, I really was so sore that I said, this is really, unless somebody wants to host us nearby, <laughs> Not doing this again. Too much of a hike. I know, and you know, I, I, you know, so I don't drive on Shabbat. There might be once in a blue moon that circumstances will require it, but otherwise not. Yeah. I'd like to go back. Oh, yeah, let me go just. Yeah. Yes, and there was another small group that I got involved in the founding of, although I wasn't one of the initial group, and that in was the seventies or yeah. In in I started getting involved. What I'm talking to you is where I went to when I left for Bregan. One was this Havara, and the other one was something called an Orthodox Minion that started in, the, in a house on Nebraska Avenue and then eventually, after about a year or so, moved to uh, Addis Israel. And we had a uh, room next to the room that the Havara was meeting in uh, for this Orthodox Minion. And about five or 10 years later, it became the egalitarian Minion. But originally, it was not egalitarian. But uh, I started davening there. It was within walking distance. And, uh, at Addis, you're saying? So yeah, that was, it, it was, was at, at both were at Addis. And uh, some rather well-known people uh, were members of that, uh, um, that original group. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep names out of it, but uh, you would know the names. Okay. I want to go back. A little bit more and explore what was happening at uh, at Verbrengen in that period. And um, one of the things I'd like to um, discuss a, some more is um, the role of of uh, tefillah, of prayer and 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 worship um, at Verbrengen, um, which some people have have said um, came more to the fore as a sort of political activism, sort of became less of a communal focus once the UJA uh, money was withdrawn. Would you agree with that? Yes. And one reason was um, the, there were several people who were mainly political and not so religious, um, or people who at least, now that one person became a rabbi. Um, so I find it ironic that I'm saying this. But at the time, they, they, they went, but they didn't take a leadership role so much because they were mainly interested in, in the radical politics and services and, and Jewish study. I mean, the, the, the um, Komash study, the Torah study on Saturday morning, they, they often came to that. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, they weren't into so much davening so much. Right. So there were there were people from JUJ that really were more political than than religiously oriented, and yeah. so those people took a less of a role. And as it became more and more a kind of a religious organization, and less and less of a political organization, the people who were interested in spiritual experience became the leaders. In the beginning, as as we've said, the the. Um the main uh, service, public service, was a Kabbalat Shabbat service on, on Friday night, followed by a communal meal. Do you recall when um, Shabbat morning services became a regular feature of Fabrengen life, beyond the just the Torah study that you right away, mentioned? Right away, right, right, away. In the, right away. I think the Torah study was J-U-J. I think we, my recollection is that we had Shabbos morning services right away. And we had uh, holiday services, too. Right. Um, so many people have used the term neo-Hasidic to describe the uh, Chavarah-style worship in general. Would you say that applies? Is that an apt description for Fabrengen as well? I was never comfortable with that. I still not. How so? Because um, it conjures up into people's minds people with strimals and long beards, although a lot of us had beards. <laughs> so maybe we were in a, in a way. <laughs> so, you know, and we, 
I guess I'm contradicting myself here because we used to read Buber's stories from the Hasidim. We did a lot of in the services. We, we brought in uh, tales of the Hasidim. We would read Rabbi Nachman's stories and uh, the Baal Shem Tov stories and, uh, you know, uh, what's a, a Berdichev, uh, Levi, Rabbi Reb, Yitzhak, Yitzhak, Yitzhak Berdichev. And uh, yeah, well, it, definitely there was a, the Hasidic uh, stories were very important. But um, something mm -hmm. about the name Neo Hasidic doesn't strike me mm -hmm. as good, in a good way, but it, I guess you could say in a way we were. You were somewhat, at any rate. Um, and many people also point to the, the um, creative tension between tradition and innovation um, yes. as a feature of Chavura style. Uh, worship also. Um, and as you said, uh, the creation of alternative forms of, of prayer. What for you stands out about that, that tension when you think of um, services at Ferengen? What do you see as... The music. Uh, music, okay. I mean, for me, that was the path to spirituality. Talk about that. Well, um, you know, I later in my Jewish learning learned that the intellect is very important in spirituality. But uh, at least at that time, I felt that it was a, it, it was a way of uh, people um, communicating with each other. As well as with God, and um, music, the music, you know, the nigunim. We were very big on nigunim, sometimes without words, um, and people could make up their own nigunim if they wanted. Uh, so, and I you can't overestimate the influence that the Karl Bach stuff had. I mean, we were singing Karl Bach melodies. And he was kind of like our Rebbe. Are there particular melodies that stand out for you? <sighs> Not really, although I have a, a CD of his Shabbos services. Um, and uh, those were all things we did. And uh, there were so many of them. It's hard to single out, single out one. And some that I didn't realize were his, that I found out later were his. Such as? Well, I, I wish I could tell you. Okay. But um, I, I, uh, I got a CD recently, you know, maybe 10 years ago, okay. of his Shabbos service, which I do uh, play occasionally. But I also, at that time, got one of his House and Love and Prayer albums. And um, How did people learn the Karl Bach melodies? Probably mainly How they introduced to the larger kahal also. Mainly through David Schneer. He 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 would do them. Now he also composed his own stuff and he did he made CDs and and we often sang some of his melodies. Some of them were very good. Um, but David was the kind of like the troubadour of the group. And um, and he was the one that uh, taught us the songs, I think. For the most part, but then you know we learned them. I learned them. Yeah. I learned how to play in my, the, the guitar, and uh, that to me was um, the thing that that stands out the most is the way we would uh, start the services with the singing. Um, we might and we might put our arm. We would get in a circle, maybe, and put our arms around, link arms. Um, a sense of uh, unity, yeah. togetherness. It's a nice feeling. And it sounds like it greatly contributed to the spiritual um, environment. Yeah. yeah. Transporting. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, th I think in some ways, a different way, in, in a different way. The Shabbos morning discussions were also 
spiritual in a way, where we each could put some of ourselves in, or our interpretations into the reading. That was, uh, you know, pretty how did much the, How did those did. tour discussions go? Who, who led them? Did they actually give a dvar, or was it just a like a, a thought that sparked a larger discussion? How, how, what was the style at Fabrenga, or did it differ from person to person? Well, it definitely differed from person to person. I don't remember there being one leader, um, but it was, you know, how can I say? There are stronger people and less strong people, and the stronger people would uh, would speak more or lead more. And uh, for example, you know, I have this recollection of Arthur Wasco doing a lot of the talking, and Rob doing a lot, I guess, doing a lot of the talking. But uh, it was open, and uh, that was to me the first really religious experience that I found of value through this organization, but it started at JUJ before we had regular services. Unpack that a little bit. You said this was the first really religious experience you had. Not the first religious experience I had, but in this context. In this context. Um, what made it a religious experience? To me, it was bringing it alive. It was making the Torah alive. It wasn't just something that somebody else told you or was part of something that was next to you, but it became part of you. And uh, it was something that we integrated into ourselves in a way that I, I never did that before. And um, I doubt that very many other people who were involved did either. Save maybe Rob, I don't know. Um, certainly, you know, yeah, it, 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 it was, I think, transformative for many people. Was the Torah, how was the Torah actually, the reading of the Torah actually, uh, how did that take place? We would sit on the floor, uh, whether or not we had a service in the beginning, I don't think we did. Um, did and you have we, an actual Torah scroll in the beginning? No. We would, we would just read from the, from the Chumashim, and uh, we would go around. We would do, we just go around in a circle reading in English, and like how we, where we stopped, I don't recall. But we would stop along the way and talk, and I don't know if we always got through the whole thing or not. I can't remember that either. But it was a discussion, and the the uh, the integration of the Torah with our lives that was the unique thing, the new thing. And it was kind of, that was just as important to me in kind of bringing that to other people too, when we were kind of like trying to bring people in uh, as the Hasidic style Kabbalah Shabbat. I thought, and it wasn't as big a crowd, but you know, that, you know, some people like that kind of thing more than others. When did it move to actually reading, chanting the Torah portion, the Parsha, in Hebrew, using traditional Nusach, that kind of uh, approach, as opposed to reading the English? I wish I could tell you. I in those early years? I don't, I, I, I think at some point we had a Torah, when we were at the Religious Action Center, I know we had an Aron. When was that? It was in those early years at some point, because Rob mentioned it also. It, it probably was in 73. I know it was in 73, because I remember in Yom Kippur, service was there. You know, when right somebody the said, when somebody said, you know, there's, been a, there's a war going on. Israel was attacked or something. Yeah. Um, I remember we were in services when somebody mentioned it. It was uh, Yom Kippur af afternoon. Um, so it was at least, at least by 1973, and I'm not sure it was before that. But when we were in the Religious Action Center, I remember reading the Torah. I used to read the Torah. Uh, 
I know I read it on Yom Kippur, but I don't know. I wish I could tell you whether we were reading on our Shabbat or not, but it's very possible that we read it on our Shabbat and then we had the Torah discussion. It somehow morphed into reading from the Torah and then doing the discussion. But I'm not sure of that. By the time Ferengen was founded in 71, a nascent Jewish feminist consciousness uh, was beginning to form, uh, which wasn't true in the very first years of Chabarat Shalom and the New York uh, right, Chabarat. Right, right. Um, which had been formed in 68 and 69. So how would you characterize the attitude towards women and women's status, women's role in communal worship in Verbrengen um, from the beginning and in, in this early period? To my recollection, it was egalitarian, but I'm not sure that the women thought it was egalitarian. Uh, I know that the women sort of started their own little uh, a group that they just met together at times, which I didn't know much about, um, at least some of the women. And um, I think that we were very kind of supportive of what was going on. What was it? I'm trying to think. There was a name to that group, Ezrat Nashim. It was formed in 91, February of 91. Yeah. So it was almost contemporaneous with yeah. Um, yeah. 71, 72. So with with Verbrengen. So I think, you know, it was part of the ethos, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you remember women participating fully as leaders in the service and um, if they we owe if, being counted in minion, those kinds of sort of issues? I think so. I think so. I don't think there were many is, uh, the uh, women who who could do it. Uh, but those who could did. That's my recollection. A little later, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe Chava Weisler um, first blamed maybe in 73. Uh, people, I mean, they had to learn how to do it. Most yeah, of them. yeah. And it's very possible. Mm -hmm. It's very possible that we started reading from the Torah in, in, in the original building, in the original year. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any direct recollection of it. Mm -hmm. I th now that I think about it, we probably did. You probably did. We probably did. We probably had it on our own. But I don't remember it specifically. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so let's turn to the issue of sort of learning, study and learning, which was another sort of major pillar of the vision for what this holistic Jewish community mm -hmm. would um, consist of. How would you describe Fabrengen's vision of um, the, the role of learning within the community? Well, most people didn't know that much. So we relied on the people who did know to teach. And there were a few people who were in a position to teach. But, but some of the teaching was a little offbeat. Like, for example, Paul was an artist, was an engineer, but he was an artist. Which Paul is this? Paul Rutke. And so he would teach silk screening. You know, so the class on silk screening, you know. And so, I don't know, there must, must have been other kinds of, you know, there was a woman named, I can't think of her name right now, who was a dancer. She, maybe she had a dance class, you know. So we had different kinds of classes and uh, we had a speaker series. I know Rob's father, Jacob Agus, came once and that was a big deal. Um, and uh, we had other people... Often it was a student rabbi, you know, a contemporary, who was coming to speak. Mm. I can't remember the names. Mm. Um, so we just had, you know, courses, you know. At and first, the courses were for the membership, or could anybody in the community take a course? Yeah, it was very open-ended. At some point, um, there was something called the Jewish Study Center or something that Jewish got Study started mm -hmm. out of, that's kind of like, when people had children, I think that also was part of it. And so they had a kind of a gun kind of a thing, you know, they wanted a Jewish educational program for, for them, but also, you know, they had, it, it was a kind of adult Jewish education thing too. Maybe it started as adult Jewish education. Jewish study center was for adults. I think it was called the for bringing children's center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two different things. Yeah. Related. I mean, yeah. many of the same people, yeah. I think, involved. Yeah. I think yeah. the Wasco children were involved, for instance. Yeah. In the... I, I have kind of only vague recollections about that. Mm -hmm. um, were you involved in, in 
learning and study through through Frobrengen? Yes. Yes. Did you teach anything? I can't I can't remember. Uh -huh. In a, in addition to the myriad activities that were going on in Washington, Frobrengen as a community was also participating in retreats. Tell us what Kfar Out is and and how that came to be. Well, it's quite accidental in a way. Uh, David Schneer and I um, had in our heads to try to find a, a place for the summer in 1971. Um, and I don't remember whether it was specifically for the idea of having for bring in retreats or not, although it was used for that. Um, and so we went to Warrington one weekend, I think it was, and he picked up a newspaper in a shop somewhere. Where's Warrington? Warrington is uh, it's west southwest of Washington, D.C. In Virginia? Vir Virginia. And it's at the beginning of the entry into the Piedmont, which is just before the Blue Ridge Mountains. And we saw an ad, a classified ad, for this horse, I don't know, it was in the horse country, uh, for a place that had a stable and, well, anyway, it was 200 acres. And uh, I don't know if we called up or we went out. Anyway, it was owned by a lawyer from Norfolk who kept his, he had a gelding, a 22-year-old gelding who he uh, rode during the fox hunt season. And, uh, well, I know he raced the horse. Um, and they had a, some races in, out in Virginia, you know, the, the, the kind of blue blood kind of, you know, farm horse people. And um, so we, somehow or other we got into contact with him. I think I talked to him, I don't remember. Anyway. He was able to rent, he wanted to rent it just so it would be occupied uh, when he wasn't there. He was there for the horse season, which was, or the fox season, which was either in the fall or in the spring. And this was just for the summer. So we rented it for, you know, two or three months. And it, it worked for me, particularly in 1971, because I had just quit my job. And one of the reasons I quit was to write this memoir about Vietnam. And so it became, I lived there for the whole summer. David did not. I mean, he came out on the weekends or whenever. But I lived there and I just had the solitude I could write. And I wrote the majority of the, the memoir uh, then, which wasn't finished till just before I went to Israel. Uh, what became of that memoir, by the way? Well, I revised it a little bit. In 72 and I sent it to um, a few publishers who said it wasn't quite ready for publication and um, so it just got put in a box and sat and uh, I uh, I thought when I was older maybe I'd know what the end of the story was <laughs> or have a more reflective view of what I was writing about, and uh, and I have actually been working on it for the last year. Um, for one thing, it was done on um, a typewriter, so I've been writing, rewriting it. As but you're putting it on the computer. As I put it on the computer, and I've I've written almost about seventy thousand words of it, which is uh, it's about two thirds of what it is. Uh, do you find that you do have a, a more perspective that you're adding as you're writing at this point? Yes, I mean I do. Um, one of the main different perspectives or added perspectives is I went back to Vietnam a year ago around this time and met with Viet Cong guerrilla, the type of whom I was looking for at the time and um, talked to him for about three hours. And I learned a lot of things. I mean, the main thing I was doing in Vietnam was I lo was looking for the guerrillas in the tunnels. Looking and for them? Guerrillas in the tunnels yes. that they were living in. And uh, this man was... In order to expose where they were. It, yeah, to find them. Yeah. And um, that was not just to, to visit them. 
Um, and so when I, I learned many things that I didn't know or confirmed things that I suspected but didn't know by interviewing this man who lived in my district. Um, it was eye-opening and made me realize all the mistakes I made <laughs> about some of the things I knew, I understood, and I was aware of, but other things I didn't know, and, and, he, and he gave me a perspective. What's an example of something you learned? I, I came to believe that the village folk were, um, were sort of under duress, put under duress by the Viet Cong. But it turns out that they were all, almost all of them were Viet Cong sympathizers. And I didn't quite get it when I was there. I thought they were kind of on the fence. But in retrospect, I'm not sure they were on the fence. So anyway, yeah. to, get, to get back to um, out. that summer at uh, Far Out and what was Far Out, so that's how we got there, and then we read it for the summer. I used it as, as a place to write my, my memoir. And um, on the weekends, uh, people would come out to visit for Shabbat. And we did have one or two, you know, community Shabbat retreats there that summer. And uh, it was fantastic. It was really... There were also, I remember one funny incident, um, there were also a head of there was a head of cattle there. Um, I don't know, maybe fifty cattle. Uh, it was because it was a tax write-off for this guy. This lawyer was using it as a tax write-off under the uh, 1986 or whatever his tax law. It could be used as a write-off if you were raising animals. I'm not sure exactly what it was now, but anyway. So one time we were having a Shabbat service in the field. And the cattle started running at us, you know, all of them. <laughs> and I said, I had learned from experience out in the field, you know, with them. I said, okay, don't panic. Just stay where you are and look at them. And there's one guy out in front. And at the last second, or maybe it won't be at the last second, but at some point, he'll stop and run away. And that's exactly what you feel like your life is really in danger. But that's exactly what happened. That one incident really stands out of my mind. <laughs> but uh, it was a beautiful place. We had a view of the Blue Ridge Mountains, a panoramic, panoramic view of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, it was really lovely. Was, were there other ways and occasions other than Weiss's farm that uh, the Chabura went on retreat, left, left its building and, and sort mm -hmm. of went on retreat outside of... DC as a community. I I have recollections of going places, but of retreats for the whole community, I don't have. I remember one time we went to Mark, Mike Tabor's farm when he first started it in Hancock, or it was in Pennsylvania, I think, just over the border. You didn't? Did you interview him? No. Okay. Well, he was one of the leaders of. Uh, of J.U.J. And he, um, he came to Fabregen, but that wasn't really his thing. Um, he was one of the really political people that yeah, you were referring to. Before. Yeah, yeah. And um, he uh, started a farm. He actually became a farmer. And he used to sell, and still does, sell his produce uh, in Adams Morgan on Saturday morning, or maybe it's other w weekdays. So uh, I think we went as a group there. Uh, but whether it was everybody, I don't know. I don't remember. People went to Weiss's farm. I think anybody who wanted to go could go to Weiss's farm. That was starting in 73. And it was three times a year, pretty much, um, for the, in the fall, sort of often on the concept of Shalosh Rigolim kind mm. of uh, schedule. I remember going at Pesach, at uh, Shavuos times. At that, I'm sorry, Sukkot times, because that's when Ayah went. Um, 
What do you remember about the experience of Weiss's Farm? And what was Weiss's Farm? You Weiss's Farm, I don't know. It was like a big farmhouse, I think. And it was in New Jersey, I think. And um, I remember we had classes. The main thing about it was classes, but I'm sure we had, uh, you know, services too. But uh, it was a chance to see these other people from these other two Havaras, from New York Havara and the Havara Shalom. And that was very nice. And Did it create a sense of bonding with these other Havarot, a sense of being in the same, some of the same space? Yeah, I think, you know, it lent, it gave you the sort of the impression that this was a movement, that uh, this is something, we were the vanguard, and uh, we were learning from each other, you know, people who wanted to teach courses could teach a session or a course or something, and uh, you know, different people led services. I don't know if we had more than one service or not. It's so long ago. And, but I went to the first few. I, I don't remember how many I went to. Um, certainly it was fun, and uh, it was a very nice experience. And uh, the best part was just meeting people that I, you know, maybe I had met before on one occasion, get the chance to spend more time and share experiences. It was nice. Did you come away feeling that, that there were significant differences as well as similarities amongst the three original Chavarot? I know I thought that, but whether it came away from that experience thinking that or not, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I can't say. Okay. Um, so let's, let's turn to the sort of concluding section of our interview today and, and talk about the impact of Chavarot on yourself personally and and your reflections on its impact on the broader community. So as we've been saying, you were involved in actively in Verbrengen from its founding in 71 through about 74. Um, and um, You said that when you left for Brangen and you were just starting to describe the, the, your motivations in leaving, um, you basically dropped out of the Havara movement. Yeah, well, there was, outside of for Brangen, New York Havara and Havara Shalom, there wasn't anything else. Although I would say that I developed a friendship with somebody in the Havara Shalom, a close friendship. And that continued. He, in fact, came down to Washington and we together wrote a book. Um, it never was published. Not one of these things that wasn't published. <laughs> but it was, it was a, a study of the American Jewish community, of Jewish identity. American Jewish identity and the Jewish community had two parts. One was, how was Jewish identity changing and how was the Jewish community changing? It was, uh, it was uh, sponsored and it was uh, asked for by the Eli Lilly Endowment. And uh, they went to the Synagogue Council. And the Synagogue Council, of course, we were the research arm. Yeah. So why I, this other person in particular? I'm trying to remember how... Oh, I met him in Israel when I was on the kibbutz. I went to Jerusalem and he was working for the Jewish Agency, I think, at the time. And then he went back to the States. He was also the founder of Pardes Institute in Jerusalem. Oh, do you want to say his name? His name is Michael Swirsky. And we became friends. So he was the one that came down. And so we visited him in, in Boston. And when he came back, he lived in the States for about five years. And they went, made Aliyah again. Okay. And um, so he came down uh, and we wrote this book together. He came down and worked with me at the Institute for six months. And so... You know, that was uh, like, he was a connection to, ha uh, to Havar Shalom. And also, he created something in Boston called the Jewish Film Center or something, Film Library. At Brandeis? I don't know where it was, but it was, they had a publication. And he was the director of it uh, for, for a time. It was a very interesting publication. And it coincided with the time I was at the Institute. Okay. So I was reaching out to see... 
enduring, something enduring with the half hour movement. He uses the, my, one of them. So is this uh, unpublished work uh, found any uh, readers? Have you circulated it? Did you at the time? It was never circulated. It's something that uh, I've actually been thinking about uh, asking Steve Cohen about putting in the uh, National Jewish Archives. Yeah, sounds like it would be an interesting addition. Yeah, it, would, it made some conclusions that it was written 40 years ago. It, it made some conclusions about the Jewish community that it turned out to be true. What year was it written? Seven, year? 77. 77. 76, 77. Can you say a few words about what kinds of conclusions you were reaching at that time? Well, the main conclusion was that there was um, kind of like two forces that were at work in Jewish life, a centrifugal force and a centripetal force, and that there was a core of getting stronger. And while it wasn't just like Lily had presupposed that Jewish life, the Jewish community was vanishing, like in the 1964 Look magazine article. Uh, it wasn't that Jews were vanishing, is that Jews were changing. There was a, 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 this dispersion, this, this uh, spinning out into the outer opens and then away. That definitely has happened. Uh, but it, 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 at the same time, there was a, a strengthening of, the, of a core. It was a smaller group, but important group because it was the creative part, it was the part that was getting stronger and they could build uh, a larger core. And uh, to me, that was the, I don't know, the major insight. At the time that you were sort of moving away from for Brengen, um, how would you characterize the for Brengen situation? It had been uh, considered a major success. Um, right from almost from the beginning, as you put it. And was there something about what was happening at Fabringen itself that was motivating you to sort of move away from it? I, it was just hard to, you know, it, it was a combination of politics and people. You know, it just, just felt like it wasn't really my place anymore. Yeah. You mentioned in your pre-interview questionnaire that um, Fabrengen was uh, struggling to uh, find a way to organize so that newcomers could feel welcome, heard, and really part of the community. Yeah. Did that continue in this early period, in this sort of in, into the, this next period that we're talking about, the sort of after the very first year or so? It, it was really in the second year that I felt that. It was when we moved into these progressively smaller and smaller places mm -hmm. and we couldn't accommodate the crowds that we were getting on Friday night. You know, more than 75 people, which just was, it was bedlam. <laughs> <laughs> people were squeezing in and people were uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was hard. I felt really bad because we couldn't really achieve what we were trying to achieve, I think. That's, that's what I think. It was, it was really something that happened during or after the second year. You said that the organizing opportunity and impact we were trying to have were lost. Right. We affected a lot of people. We affected ourselves, mostly. I mean, the people who were the core, they changed. We changed the most. We benefited the most. No question. But there, and there were people who were kind of like in the middle, who weren't actually in the periphery, but came regularly, who were also, their lives were transformed. It had a larger mission to transform. And we lost some of the opportunity, I thought, to transform more people's lives. And um, we were, I, th I was about, and I think, Rob was about, I think some of the people were about transforming Jewish life. That's what we were about. And you can't transform Jewish life in one place. Um, and you can't have the intensity of the experience with 100 people that you can have with 25 people or 50 people. 
And that's what we were striving for. And so my feeling was that maybe, you know, we split up. That this was anathema to people. Split up, we couldn't split up. You know, each one of us dedicate ourselves to a group and try to bring that group to this kind of like what we were achieving, which was kind of an elevated spot. We were feeling, you know, it was transformative for us. It changed our lives. Each person was changed differently. I mean, I could go through some of the examples, but it changed my, my life. Okay, that's a great segue. How did it change other people's? You said you could give other examples and also your own. Yeah, well, let me start with other people's examples. Yeah. I, I remember there was one, this one woman who was uh, a feminist and very radical feminist. And um, she was, you know, she went to the retreats. Oh, yeah, that's right. We did have a retreat. We went to a retreat. I don't remember what it was. It was... I don't know if it was Harper's Ferry, but it was someplace. We, yeah, we did have a retreat. I know we camped out because she went to it. Um, anyway, she, a few years later, went to Israel. And she married, she got an uh, arranged marriage with a uh, Haredi husband in a Haredi community and became a Haredi person with lots and lots of children. I remember Aya met, met her at one point. Um, and uh, I was your wife. Jim. I was my wife. It, you know, she was trans. She was a different person. I mean, she was completely different. Um, but you know, I suspected you know somebody who was you know like she she must have been like an all in person. You know, whatever she did, she was all in. And at the time I met her, she was all into feminism, and she wanted a complete. And, and in some ways, I was like that. I mean, I wanted a holistic community. I wanted a communal. I wanted to set up a, a kibbutz in Virginia. <laughs> I quit my job. I was all in. Um, and uh, this person was like that, I think. <laughs> she found it in Israel with the, uh, I don't know if it was Hasidim, it probably wasn't a Hasidim, but it was that kind of community. It was, it was ultra, ultra Orthodox. There was another fellow. He, uh, more, than, more than one, became rabbis. As you know, Arthur Roscoe became a rabbi. But there were others. There's one person who's currently a rabbi in Brooklyn, um, a fellow with long, had long hair there, and still ha then and still has long hair. He, his parents actually were from my synagogue over here in Chevy Chase. Um, and um, uh, who was the other person that became a rabbi? Um, well, David Schneer became a rabbi. David Schneer became a rabbi. It, maybe it'll come to me. Yeah. Um, Paul Rutke, he married a Helen Bell maker, uh, Alava Shalom, she passed away. And they, they, went, they made Aliyah, and they joined the Haredi community in Mea Sharim. They lived in Mea Sharim. She had, I don't know, nine children or seven children. I forget how many children they had. And they adopted the Haredi life. Paul is still a Haredi Jew. He lives in Baltimore. He came back. Uh, there's another fellow who uh, made Aliyah. Uh, I don't know if he came back or not. Um, there was another couple that got married and they made Aliyah. They had some children and they ultimately divorced. He lives in Boston now with a second wife, but the children live in Israel. Uh, somebody like Chava Weisler became a professor, an academic at the time. She was in Fabrian. She was a librarian at the Library of Congress. And um, I don't know. She at some point decided to, uh, that she could be the real thing and she could be a professor. And uh, she went back to school and did it. And uh, I haven't had much contact with her. She's somebody who was tr really changed by the experience, I think. And there are others, I can't, I, there was another one that became a rabbi, I can't remember. But um, uh, I guess I should talk about myself a little bit. Well, for me, as you can guess from all the things I've been talking about, it was transformative for me. 
Uh, I had I was looking for something when I came back from Vietnam, and um, I didn't realize it really for a couple of years. It took a while. I came back in '69, and it wasn't until 1970 that something clicked in me, uh, and uh, JOJ, and then for Brian was a was a vehicle for me to to begin a Jewish journey. And I think of my life the whole time since as this Jewish journey. And I've continued to, uh, to change and grow, I hope. Uh, as a Jew, I've, a lot of it has to do with a study group that I joined. There were mostly were people from uh, the uh, Addis Israel Kavara that's been existing, studying together twice a month for 40 years. It became kind of like a family even. Uh, and we, we have studied, you name it, we've studied it. The Talmud, Hasidut, mysticism, Musar, Amer uh, Jewish literature. Um, It started off with the Tanakh and the, the Chumash. The, um, you know, we, we studied a lot. Of, we studied the prophets. We've had the great advantage of um, of having a, a person who was really extraordinary writing curricula for us. Very serious guy uh, who uh, has written all the curricula, just about all the curricula for us. Very detailed curricula. I could show you an example of it, but it's readings, and every other week. We meet on Sunday night and the different family leads and different family hosts. And over the years, we've, you know, gotten close together. Some of us have passed away. Most of us are grandparents now. Um, we share simchas together and, and uh, funerals together. Um, but the main thing for me, besides this personal element, I feel close to all these, uh, so many of these people, was that how I was able to grow through Jewish learning. So the Fabrangian experience was this pivot for me. It, it started something that has sort of propelled me through different stages. I'm not a radical anymore. I'm not even a leftist anymore. I'm pretty conservative, actually. Um, but in terms of, you know, committed to the Jewish enterprise, That's what I'm about. Why did you decide to go the sort of synagogue route? You, after after you left um, the the for Rungen, um, There's one other thing, if I can interrupt. And that is, I met my wife. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Wait, how does that fit into this particular piece of the discussion? I was introduced uh, to her by. Uh, Fabrangan friend. She was living in Jerusalem with two people from Fabrangan when she was a student at Hebrew University. And uh, she was an Israeli. She was. Uh, she was. An, uh, she was born in Tunisia, but she was an Israeli there. She was going to the. She graduated from the Hebrew University, and um, she was a Hebrew University student. And these. Uh, Women were students in this kind of like external program for Americans or whatever it was. And they were rooming together. And one invited my wife to be wife to visit in the, in the States. And she came in the summer of 1974. And she introduced her to several people in Fabrangan. And uh, I was the lucky one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I met her, and um, in fact, um, um, I, you know, I guess I should feel myself indebted to this person. Yes. Um, sorry, you were getting so on to another to, question. I, to ask you, I didn't so want to forget that one. Thank you. <laughs> so you you were saying um, earlier that after leaving for Bringen, you you. Um, were among the founders of a, 
a minion at, at Israel here, and then here in Washington, and then another minion that more orthodox minion that also met in a room at Addis Israel, yeah. for these two minions, and then the study group. Uh, but they were, this was sort of how wrote connected, so to speak, that connected to synagogues as opposed to independent yeah. how wrote. Um, and also later in the 70s, um, the Chavarot did come together in 79. There was the first um, larger summer conference uh, at Rutgers and over time, there's since then, essentially, there's been a summer institute that's happened at Chabra Summer Institute, which it sounds like you have not um, participated in. So what I want to know is what sort of moved you away from that, uh, that model uh, or, or actual just engagement with what was happening in the, in the Chabra world? It was two things. One was... I felt like we weren't turned outward enough. And the other was the politics, which I mentioned. And I felt, and partially it was my experience working at that institute, the Senegal Council of America's Institute, realizing that there was a larger outworld, world out there that wasn't really being directly affected by us. And over time, Fabrengan turned more and more inward. And, uh, and more away from politics, as you said. Yeah, yeah. And it ultimately became a, more of a conventional kind of a congregation. Although I don't want to belittle them because I'm not sure what they're doing. Uh, but um, it, it just wasn't for me anymore. I mean, I've, I've, I, uh, I was not, I was increasingly less interested in alternatives to Judaism or to traditional Judaism. I wanted to get more into traditional Judaism, to learn more about it, to understand, to learn. And um, I think that's, um, that's something that I'm, I'm very dedicated to and I really believe is the key to Jewish continuity is, is learning. I, I feel that without learning, how do you perpetuate? How do you continue the tradition? You can you can change it, but if you don't know what it is, how can you change it? You're just something different. So, um, but I, uh, you know, the terms of the style, the connectivity, those things I continued to be involved in at uh, Or Kodesh, I was uh, involved in starting a chavara there, as well. And we met for many years. Actually, those sound like um, essentially manifestations of the idea you had earlier of sort of spinning off some smaller communities, um, even from Ferengen, that would become sort of core communities in and of themselves. Yeah, well, I actually never thought about that until you just mentioned it, but maybe so. Uh, I do know that uh, I felt like the problem with conventional synagogue services, it's still there. And there is this impulse to smaller groups and to, you know, more personal connection to the people in davening and uh, celebrating holidays. And it's pretty widespread. And um, I just decided there, was, there were other places I could uh, express this uh, inclination. So from the perspective of nearly half a century, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the founding of the first Gobara. How would you assess the contributions and impact of Fabreng and, and of the other early independent Gobarot on, on Jewish life? What were the main contributions? Have been? Well, one was to stimulate the Gobarot in synagogues. Uh, one was to uh, kind of like help the engine of reform of Jewish education or the, uh, the spending of more Federation money for Jewish education, the emphasis on uh, religious education in, in the day schools. I think that it, it uh, moved the needle slightly in that direction. 
Uh, it also helped. It was a place for uh, the people who, uh, who uh, populated the uh, Jewish academia, the academics, the Jewish studies um, uh, movement. It gave them, it pro propelled them, I think. Uh, it certainly, Havarat Shalom is a good example of that. Uh, but it was, there were little bits of it elsewhere as well. I think the, as I said, I think the idea of synagogue Havarot, I think, owes something to the Havarah movement. And I think, I don't know for sure, but, you know, there's this independent movement, uh, independent minion movement now. And it's really a reincarnation of the Havarah movement. How so? Well, um, how so? It's a um, more intense, intensive, more family-oriented, uh, uh, more participatory approach to uh, religious practice and religious education, more intensive learning, and you see you see, manifest, you see the DC Minion, for example, here. Uh, you see the Altschul in Brooklyn. You see there's something called Tikkun Lel Shabbat downtown here. These are, all, these are organizations that a new generation is involved in that didn't participate in the Havara movement. And I wonder to what extent does the one draw from the other, because I'm not sure. Did you say that your son was involved with, in one of these things? Yes. He, he, there's something called Jews in the Woods, which is a uh, confab, a uh, get-together retreat for uh, a young adults in mainly, you know, northeastern colleges from, say, Virginia to, you know, New England. And it usually happens somewhere in New England or New York, upstate New York. My son was... Uh, I think he was the leader of that for a time. And uh, there is something called Moshe Houses. You may have heard of those. And he lived in a Moshe House. What is a Moshe House? Moshe House is something, it's a, it's a, in some ways it's a little like Verbrengen. Um, Verbrengen was a house where people came. Usually they didn't live there. Some people lived there, but usually the people didn't live there. And so Moshe House is a place where a certain number of people get bored or room. They live there on condition that they contribute something to the Jewish community, either in the Moshe House environment, like they lead services or they prepare meals or whatever, or they do social or political action activities. And uh, have, they have different... They're in various cities around the country. I think there's one or two here in Washington. There's one in Boston. But they, they have different... In Boston, it's called... It's in Brookline. It's called Kavod House. And that's where my son lived. And, you know, I went... I, we visited him once or twice. And um, it, it felt a lot like for Brangen. We went to Tikkun Lel Shavuot, the same kind of people, downtown when he was visiting his, one of his friends. It really, it was not only felt like for Brangen, it was in the same place. <laughs> it, it, although it's downstairs, it was in the basement of the Religious Action Center of the Reform Movement down on Massachusetts Avenue. It was even in the same place, the same kind of, you know, potluck meals. Although they're, they're a little different. Now they have, you know, uh, vegetarian, kosher vegetarian, strictly kosher vegetarian. And... Uh, I don't think they have non-vegetarian, but they may have four, and one, four, four varieties. But it was the same kind of like um, social occasion, and Jew Jewish and social together. And, um, and the same thing for Kavod House in, in Boston. It was, you know, there was a leader, but it was open-ended. It was people coming to meet people in a Jewish environment and a service and a meal. And I remember one time we were up there, I don't think it was the first time, but the second time up at Kavod House. My son lived there, I think, two years, one year? I don't remember. Um, 
But I remember having lunch there uh, and they were having a discussion about, and these people were involved in uh, Jews in the Woods too. And, and I remember the discussion was about the next uh, Jews in the Woods retreat and how do we make everybody comfortable? There's so many different kinds of people. We don't want anybody to come to this thing so that where they feel the uncomfortable. So they were thinking, well, how do we organize the service or services so that there's something for everybody? That is smart thinking and that's very constructive. And uh, I think it, it's the best, uh, some of the best of what came out of the Kabbalah movement, the kind of things that I was hoping would happen and people, there would be a place for everybody. Yeah. And I see that that, it, it certainly seems a lot like yeah. just a reincarnation. The last thing I would say is Karl Bach. Now Karl Bach uh, had a m major influence in our, our organization. I, I don't know to what extent, I'm sorry I touched the mic. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what role it played at Kavar Shalom uh, because I, I don't think, I think I was there once maybe, but it was a major thing um, certainly at Fabrengen, probably elsewhere. But today, Karbach music is taken over the modern Orthodox world. You go to a modern Orthodox service and they're singing Karbach all over, even Canada. Karbach's had a tremendous influence and I think that's Karlbach. I don't think you can necessarily attribute it to the Havara movement, but the, there's there's certain some there's perhaps some influence because we were the uh, the fertile ground in which this took root, and it was shocking to me when I went to services at Kesher Israel, which is down in Georgetown here in Washington, uh, some years ago, maybe twenty years ago. And I walk in, they're doing Kabbalah Shabbat. And this is Karbach. It's Karbach. It's all Karbach. I said, how did this happen? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think those are, you know, Karbach and that style has really taken a place in Jewish life. And this uh, has been a change uh, for the better. Are there any things that you would point to as uh, what you consider the major challenges or, or failings of the Chavara movement um, early on and from these in these early days of the the founding Chavara or as it's evolved over the past half century? I think I mentioned it already, which is the turning inward, the lack of further outreach that was possible that that didn't happen. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, how can you say that, um, you know, I won't na mention any names, but there are many eminent scholars that have grown out of Chavarat Shalom um, who have affected many, many people. And uh, how do you count that? How do you add that all up? It's hard to do. Uh, so even though... Um, you know, we were maybe torn between reaching out and reaching in, being elite and being every man um, and um, a place for everybody. Uh, you know, we fell short in a lot of ways, the ideal, but we, I think we accomplished something. Yeah. Final question. So as the, the challenges of the 21st century for the Jewish community sort of come into sharper view here, uh, do you see a future for Chavarot per se or uh, for um, sort of the offspring of Chavarot? Where, where do you see this all going as we move into the 20th century? 21st. Uh, 21st. Yeah. Well, I think the independent Minyanim are a manifestation of this uh, inclination or movement, or whatever have you. And there's this middle ground that uh, Steve Cohen writes about, the, uh, the committed Jewish middle, he 
calls it, it's mentioned in that article that I just pointed out to you, um, that he sees as the future, or the alternative future, uh, the future in the middle, <laughs> or what have you, of uh, American Jewish life. What does he mean by the future in the middle, or the middle, middle ground? He, he's, he's, it's like the, the right edge of conservative Judaism and the left edge of orthodoxy and the people in between. We used to call ourselves in-betweenies. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about the days of my Havara involvement, but, you know, yeah. later. You know, people who didn't quite fit in anywhere. Um, and making space for that is what the independent minyanim do. Or do. And uh, they're, I can't say how pervasive it is, but they're around in the major cities. And... Uh, I think there's some bleed out to or, or movement out of those into the modern orthodox or the open orthodox. Um, there's a certain kind of institutional um, weakness to these things. And as people grow older and they're looking for you know, Jewish education, for their children and things like that, that um, the Chavara model or the independent minion struggles with. And I've, you know, I've heard people talk about it because I went to one of the national conferences of the independent minion movement and they talked about it. And But many good things are happening, like uh, Machon Adar in New York, for example. That's, that's descended from the Chavara movement, in my opinion. And that's a very positive influence. So, and, you know, and I think the left wing of orth orthodoxy is has something is owes something to the Havara movement. What about Jewish feminism and the, the changing role and status of women within Jewish life? Do you see the see the changes that have come about over the past half century as in any way coming out of the Havara movement or owing anything to the Havara movement? I don't really know. I would say that many of these people probably, the women, were affected by the Chavara movement and therefore they probably got some reinforcements, a positive reinforcement from this base, it gave them courage to move forward and, and uh, express their ideas and uh, practices and their, um, you know, their agenda for Jewish life. and. Um, what you see now is, you know, in orthodoxy, for example, which is a pretty hard nut to crack in this in this area, you see the Jewish Feminine Alliance or something? It's Jofa. Jofa. Well, that's ortho pretty much orthodox women, I believe. Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance. Yeah. Um, I think that movement owes something to the Havara movement. And I think Ezra Nashim, I think there was an overlap and the people that came after that. And then all the Jewish academics, the women, women's studies. If you would go, it doesn't exist anymore, but there used to be a library out in Rockville. Um, and they had a shelf on books about women or women's studies. Or you look at the campuses where they have Jewish studies program. This is like the, the largest change in academia probably in the last half century is women's studies and Jewish women's studies. I mean, there are all these new women scholars uh, are out there and now, you know, I don't know, leaders of their communities or they speak in the larger community. They're sought after speakers. We have plenty of them coming around here and I assume elsewhere. So I think that uh, fem I think the Jewish feminist movement propelled that forward and I think the Havara movement as I said was the fertile ground in which that uh, germinated. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to add before we close? I'm sure I forgot something but... I know you wanted to say something about Adin Steinsalski. You want to just mention that? Before okay, we yes. It's, it's, I have a little wonderful little story. Uh, it's actually a two-part story, separated by about 30 years. Okay. Um, the first part of it uh, occurs in, in 1971, during the first year of Verbrengen. 
and Dean Steinzahl shows up at um, at Verbringen. And I don't remember who arranged it or how he found us, but one night we, we found ourselves sitting in the upstairs living room where we held our services. He was sitting on the floor against one uh, panel of windows and we were sitting on the other side or in the middle and having a little tete-a-tete -tete with uh, Dean Steinzahl, who so was about 40, 40, I don't know, he's about 80 now, it was 40 years ago. So he was around 40 at the time. He was a fairly young man. He didn't look so young. And my understanding, he, he, he well, I'll leave that out. Um, anyway, so we had a really wonderful conversation with him. He's, he's just such a great man. Uh, so charismatic and in, in his uh, unique way. I mean, he's very special. And uh, I have had the, and so he taught us, you know, he spoke to us, but he just was wondering what we were about because he had heard about us, obviously. And one of the perspectives I have is of my later meeting with him. But in between, I occasionally got to listen to him or speak to him um, through other connections, once in Jerusalem and a couple of times here in Washington. But this one occasion was Martin Luther King weekend. And uh, he spoke at our Kodesh congregation here in Chevy Chase. And uh, so I brought a book that he edited of Rabbi Nachman's stories that he translated and wrote a commentary with. And I brought it with me so he could sign it. And so afterward, I walked up to him and I said, gee, I have this book of yours. I'd really love if you could uh, autograph it for me. And he says to me, thank you so much for showing this to me because I've never seen this book before. <laughs> he had never seen the English translation. <laughs> and, and secondly, I said, also, you know, Rabbi, we've met before. It was on the a living room floor of um, Verbrengen. And he says, no, it wasn't. It was Jews for Urban Justice. <laughs> so um, I find it really kind of amazing you know, that he uh, kind of like remembered the details of that meeting. Absolutely. Absolutely. 40, 30, I think maybe 30, 35 years before. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story and for, and for talking to us. My pleasure. Today. It's been wonderful to talk to you. I've learned a lot. Uh, great. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much.